I'd like to call to order the Monday, April 22nd public hearing on Council Order 2019-034, Ordinance Amending Title 17 Zoning, Section 5.1.8, Table of Off-Street Parking Requirements. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a quorum in committee as of the second, but I do want to make sure that folks know this was scheduled to start at 6.30 p.m., so uh, I do have to close the public hearing portion, and then when we get a quorum, adjourn, adjourn, thank you, adjourn it, and then when we have a quorum, we'll reopen the public hearing, so that way we can take testimony when we have a quorum of the body. So at this point, I'd like to close the public portion, adjourn, adjourn the public portion of this meeting at 6.31 p.m. Thank you. I would like to call back into order the Monday, 20, April 22nd public hearing on Council Order 2019-034, um, Ordinance Amending Title 17 Zoning Section 5.1.8, Table of RF Street Parking Requirements. Um, at 6.32 p.m., this was originally scheduled to start at 6.30 p.m., and so if it goes over, uh, we'll make sure to make up the time on the back end. Um, with that, uh, I would like to ask anyone wishing to speak to come to the podium. Um, just make sure when you do to state your name and address and if you do not wish to speak, we would like your support or opposition recorded. You can sign in on the sheet of the table in the back of the chamber. Um, so good evening. If you could just state your name and address. Um, good evening. My name is Sarah Montague. I live at 151 C Street here in Quincy. Um, I'd like to thank the council for letting me, giving me a chance to talk. And I would uh, like to voice my opposition to this proposal to increase the legally required minimum amount of parking people need to build. Um, Including the guest parking provision, this would in increase the 2.25 spaces per household. The parking requirement in these areas in Quincy residents just don't need all of this parking. The average Quincy household has only 1.3 cars. And in some areas, including a lot of the areas most affected by this, that, that total's even lower, that average is even lower, I should say. 18% um, of Quincy households and 31% of our senior households have no cars at all. And we're asking them now to pay for not only two parking spaces, but 2.25 spaces for cars that they don't have, spaces that they will not use. Um, and the extra parking is not cheap. I mean, we like, you know, because the builders have to build it, so we, we usually just have it bundled into our rent or the prices we pay anywhere else, we tend to think of it as free. But it, it can be fairly expensive to build. Um, in a structured parking, a structured parking garage, the average price is around 25 to 30,000. That's without the cost of land, and um, which works out to be, you know, uh, 100, 150 extra in month, when, especially when to include maintenance costs added into people's rent. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, for two spaces already <laughs> built in for a carless household, they're already paying 3,000 a year for parking that they don't need, don't, don't have any use for. And uh, this extra 0.25 spaces will add on an extra $400, and maybe that doesn't seem like a ton, but I mean, in a time when, uh, Many Quincy households are already struggling with housing costs. It's, it's an added burden that they don't need. And um, I'd say maybe the worst part is that increasing parking requirements doesn't even really help with the issue. By spacing everything out and ensuring that we pay for parking, whether we use it or not, high parking minimums make driving more attractive relative to the alternatives. Studies have shown that having more free parking near homes increases car ownership, defeating the purpose of the requirements and increasing traffic, another large problem here in Quincy, and carbon emissions as well. Um, and all that being said, you know, obviously I understand that in many parts of Quincy there is a problem with overuse of the on-street parking, but there are more direct ways to do it, deal with this, looking at our residential uh, parking sticker policies, or enforcing them more perhaps, and uh, maybe you know, some reworking there that can more directly address the issue more effectively address the issue and not have all the negative kind of side effects. All right, um, that's all. Thank you for Thank letting you. me speak. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Good evening. If you could just say your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Maya Dykstra. I live at 64 Ellington Road in, in Wollaston. Um, tonight, I would like to address the issue of the parking, the limited number of parking spaces and if we raise the limited, the minimum number of parking spaces, not only would this increase that, 
the housing cost of um, in Quincy, it would also cause unnecessary climate change because instead of implementing better methods of um, transport transportation and public transportation, increasing bike lanes, um, it would be increasing car use and causing more um, places for cars to use. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? In favor or against? Evening, John. If you could state your Thank full you name and address for the record. Trail, 62 Ground Wall Road. Um, when I first actually spoke on at planning about this, and message from planning is any order that the council sends down, they want a council person to be there to explain the order to them at planning. But unfortunately, we had meetings on the same night. It was very confusing. That's why I was confused about what was up with the order. So even though at planning, I said I was in favor of it, upon looking at our parking chart, which is 5.1 point something, I don't know, it's kind of confusing. I actually thought it was part of the four dimensional zoning. And it doesn't make any sense. Not only am I not for raising it to 1.75, I am for making it 1.5 and making them all 1.5. Because right now in business C, we're allowing one space per dwelling unit. And to make someone who wants to add a second dwelling unit who owns that property in residential B to say that if you want to build a second unit, instead of having three spaces, you need four is an unnecessary hardship. If the city's going to develop, let's develop everywhere fairly. We do need to look at the parking plan. The thing why 1.75 makes no sense, do the math. 1.75 plus 1.75, 3.5. Add another 1.75. We're still not at a regular number. Okay, so I'm not sure who came up with that in the first place. Like, what do you even do when you're at 3.5? Does it raise up to four or does it go down to three? At least when you're at 1.5, it hits the number every other time. So um, I think the whole parking thing needs to look in. There's something in there that says Marina that needs half a space per parking space. And I know every time I go to Marina, I can't find a parking space. So. Um, we need to basically um, support development equally throughout the city. People who live in Res B and Res C, they're developing like crazy in those districts, just like they are in Business C. The only, you know, even if you look at Res A, I don't understand that. Please look at that, counselors, because Res A says if it's more than four bedrooms, or more than five bedrooms, you need four parking places. So can I build a 20 bedroom unit and still only have four parking spaces? So we have to look at what people are doing because that's sort of what is happening. There's some overdevelopment of some crazy houses in the Res A. Res A needs to be protected and we need to be equal to everyone. So um, I hope enough counselors um, vote no to this, even though I do wanna send a shout out to Councilor Kroll, who is a big advocate of the people in the community. And this is about trying to make everyone happy. We need this new growth so your taxes don't go up. If there's not new growth, then the taxes are gonna go up for everybody. And there just isn't parking in the city and things are changing and this is a new city these are new times and I feel bad for the few, but you can't make everyone happy at the same time. Um, Council Kroll and Council McCarthy, I see them a lot of time advocating all the time for their constituents at the meetings. And it'd be nice to have more people trying to make everyone happy, but we have to think how do we grow as a whole and how do we do what's best for the city of Quincy not just for one person. So what's best for the city of Quincy and what's best for development is to actually decrease parking, not increase parking. And that's all I have to say, thank you. 
Thanks, John. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, I do want to just um, read into the record that there were uh, two emails that were sent in opposition, one from uh, Mike and Cindy Cotter, and another from uh, Maggie McKee as well, so that will be entered into the public <coughs> record, correct? Thank you. Okay. All right, um, at this point, we will close the public portion of this meeting at 6.42 p.m. I would like to call to order the Monday, April 22nd meeting of the Quincy City Council Ordinance Committee. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Kroll. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Hughes. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Present. Councilor Panlucci. Chairman Liang. Present. Six members. Thank you. Seven. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. Um, and I do want to, uh, just really quickly before we get started with uh, Mr. Fatsis, who I believe is here, um, who will answer some questions, just to let folks know, uh, leading up to this evening, this ordinance um, was advertised on March 1st in the Patriot Ledger. The public hearing was advertised on April 4th in the Ledger, the public hearing for tonight. Um, the planning board had a public hearing that was held on April 12th, 2019 and closed the public hearing. And the planning board approval um, had issued a positive recommendation to the city council at the April 12th, 2019 planning board meeting and a copy is everyone, in, in everyone's packets. Um, with that, I'd like to call up Mr. Fatsis from the planning board uh, to help answer any questions. Mr. Fatsis? Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Jim Fatsis, Director of Planning in the City of Quincy. Uh, this, this ordinance came before the planning board. It was heard in a public meeting. And the planning board uh, gave it a positive recommendation to move from 1.75 to 2. Um, also, uh, the planning department in discussion amongst ourselves, we feel that uh, at this stage of the game, uh, 1.75 and uh, 2, uh, we round up to 1.7, we round up to 2 often. Uh, the planning board has the ability to, uh, in fact, uh, you know, make this, make this round up. But we can also give relief in the instance that relief is requested, as the ZBA can as well. So. That is what was sent to us by the council, was to move from 1.75 to 2. We don't think that this is a major difference in the practices of both the planning board and the, uh, the planning department and <coughs> our recommendations to the planning board. So with that, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Fatsi. I'd like to open up to my colleagues with any questions or comments. Councilor Kroll. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Liang. Good evening, Jim, and as always, thank you for, uh, for coming and um, your professionalism, you know, obviously as a department head, but throughout the travels of this conversation. I also want to thank, as I sincerely mean it, members of the public who come out and participate in public dialogue. I think that's exactly why we host these meetings, and that's exactly why we have these forums. So I appreciate it. Uh, the amendment, obviously, before the council is to uh, increase the parking ratio by a quarter, um, you know, 0.25 from 1.75 to two. And Jim, I think you summarized in a very, you know, um, easy to digest format, essentially our conversation over the last six or nine months where I had uh, originally introduced, you know, the call for kind of an, an overarching zoning analysis, but um, going from the 1.75 to the two is what I see uh, a standard practice or a standard ask coming out of your department. So how we got to this evening was, you know, why wouldn't we just sort of memorialize that? Um, because there have been times, um, you know, and I do spend a lot of time at the planning board and zoning board uh, participating in, you know, development projects that uh, impact my neighborhood. But, um, you know, I've always viewed it as a ward counselor. It's, it's better for me to have more tools in my toolbox when I'm thinking about the future of you know, my district. And um, 
I feel like a lot of the developers that I deal with are, uh, are quality developers and they're already producing two parking spaces per unit because I think on the resale side of it, and that's non like, transit oriented uh, sites, non URDP sites, that's as we get out into the neighborhoods. I feel like the uh, marketability certainly increases to their consumers because as we all know, um, you know, certain cross sections of Quincy, particularly new housing stock is becoming rather pricey. Um, well, I just kind of want to share that dialogue with the council that, you know, it has been kind of going back and forth with uh, myself and Planner Fatsies for, um, for some time. And I think it's, I think you bring up a very important point and it was something that we kind of went over uh, numerous times is that, you know, a potential project has the ability to file a waiver, file for and ask for a waiver. And I would think, at least in my mind, be project specific, but if it was a good project that was, you know, serving a cause, whether it's replacing a blighted property with improved housing stock or, you know, servicing some sort of need, um, and there was a legitimate reason to go to a lower parking requirement on that particular project, be certainly open to it. But it's creating a benchmark, creating a starting point, and like I said, whereas your ass coming out of your department from day one is for two, I just thought it was an important exercise to, uh, to go through and, um, you know, like I said, we've had numerous conversations. Um, I'd ask for if Mr. Walker had anything that he wanted to share through the, uh, through the chairwoman, because it has been a conversation that I've had with uh, the mayor, um, and obviously adhering to the protocol, right? Good ideas hopefully have a lasting impact so that's why I thought it was, you know, prudent not only to introduce it to the body, but go through the proper channels and ask the planning board, which I think planning and zoning have the toughest board uh, volunteer positions in the city, you know, to weigh in on it and say, hey, are we on the mark or are we off the mark? Um, so, you know, to point out what you had shared, Madam Chairwoman, they saw it to be a, a positive. So I think it arms them with an additional, um, you know, set of tools when they're going through each individual application. So. That was a long-winded explanation, but um, that's sort of the evolution over the last six months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just before I move on, because I know Councillor Mahoney um, and Council McCarthy wanted to speak, did you? So, did you have a question for Mr. Walker? Or did you want him to elaborate on on the conversation the two of you had for the sake of the conversation here tonight? I was just looking to more or less provide additional context to the councillor, so that, no rush for sure. Whatever you deem Are you appropriate. Comfortable yielding your time? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Walker. Through you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, thank you, Councillor Kroll. Uh, as the Councillor mentioned, uh, he's had uh, multiple conversations uh, with our office, with the Mayor directly, uh, relative to this proposal. The uh, Mayor does intend uh, to sign it if approved uh, by this body, uh, and his position uh, goes uh, exactly uh, to what Councillor Kroll had mentioned, uh, that this is another tool in the toolbox for our regulatory agencies. It doesn't automatically mean that every project uh, is going to have a higher uh, parking number, uh, but it provides uh, the planning board and the zoning board the capability uh, to take a look at projects on a case-by-case -case basis and really drill down and give them that added measure of uh, potential layer of scrutiny that they can provide uh, certain projects. Uh, as he has discussed with many members of this body, including Councilor Kroll, uh, he holds great deference, gives great, great deference to the council's role uh, when it comes to zoning uh, matters. Uh, and there's another uh, example of, of why he plans, uh, if approved by this body, uh, to sign this uh, into effect. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Council Mahoney? Hi, Jim. I always get confused which one I'm using, so. Um, for the people at home that are watching, I just think it's always helpful to kind of ground everything. I realize that um, Council Kroll's um, is for BC, but could you give us what the, what the, for Res A, Res B, and Res C currently? For residents, say, uh, there should be two per dwelling with one to two bedrooms, three per dwelling with three to four bedrooms, four per dwelling with five or more bedrooms. Okay. Residence B is currently 1.75 per, uh, per dwelling unit. Res C is 1.75 per uh, one dwelling unit. Okay. 
And when we talk about um, Res B and C, um, if it's a one bedroom or a two bedroom, it's still 1.75? That's correct. Okay. Um, and the reason why I ask that is because I, there's, so there's definitely development that's happening in the city of Quincy, and I've been to many of the meetings as well. And when we're close to a transit oriented, um, like the MBTA's um, stations, that's where we're really struggling because we really want to make sure that that's a walkable and I can see the, um, the need to be able to maybe push back and hopefully people will have less use of cars. But residents B and C are all over the city and some of them are, you know, well away from a train station and even bus, buses, believe it or not. Um, so when we talk about, and I, I struggle with this because I think, you know, riding bikes and walking in the city, but at the same time, when I, when I, and I know this my sister was investing in Quincy and she's like, what about this area? And I said, well, it's really hard because you'll only have one, you can only have one car in that, that particular area, but people will not, that, that, I just know that they don't, they won't drive, they'll, they'll be parking on the streets and that's where we have the biggest problem. So this is where I do struggle. I don't know, when did we come up with the 1.75 or how long ago was the 1.75? I think it was the last time that the uh, zoning. entire zoning plan was was changed over. That would be my uh, my belief. I'm yeah, and I know that that's also before us in the hopes that we'll be looking back at the zoning mm -hmm. again. So, and and just to explain, so when you do, so when we do have and and an, a and a developer comes and they're and they're claiming to have this be a transit oriented development, do we look at it when you're when they're on the outskirts, really far away from anything? Trans, I realize there's buses and stuff, but do we do we try to push or talk them into having two spaces at that time, or do they go strictly? I know they don't because I've been to many of them that they say sure. the requirement is 1.75. That's correct. So it's just I'm just curious how many developers actually will, if pushed, will go up to that two point. Um, most developers, when they come in, mm -hmm. uh, dependent on as you said location, mm -hmm. they're making a presentation. Sometimes it's a monetary decision that they're making. Mm -hmm. They'd like to do less mm -hmm. and. Um, if it's far away from transit-oriented develop, if it's not a transit-oriented development, then, you know, I, I've had people come before the board and come before the the, uh, the department and say, well, it's a mile away from the T station, and I feel, you know, that's close enough, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily close enough for elderly residents. It's not as close as it is for folks that are uh, impaired. Their their mobility impairment is 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 part of a, mm -hmm. a reality here. Um, it's important to note that what we also listen to very closely to is the actual city council. Each city councilor has an opportunity. Obviously, the city councilors uh, in the wards come to the meetings and they share their thoughts and their ideas. Um, more often than not, it's to be a little bit more stringent on parking. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will say that, um, you know, also the at larges come to the meetings. I see councilor. Mahoney at many of our meetings. And so we, we try to listen to the testimony that's presented. Uh, if someone has a compelling reason, they feel they're pretty close, and we feel they're pretty close too, there wouldn't be a hesitancy to take it from 175 down to 1.5 mm -hmm. with the support of the council mm -hmm. and with the support of, of the, the department. The department mm -hmm. will make a recommendation generally to the planning board. Uh, so just to say what the more recent history has been. At 1.75, for the most part, we're rounding up. Um, if someone is, for instance, going to uh, build a condo versus a apartment, generally speaking, dependent on that particular buyer, they may feel that they want two parking spaces. We've had condos come before us where they're only looking to provide one parking space. So each project is looked at individually. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no great precedence. Uh, I will also share with the council that uh, when we were looking at the uh, elevation property, they came up with a number that was far higher than what we thought was appropriate. And in counseling them, we told them, look, look at, you know, you have to meet what you have to meet. Uh, and it was a PUD, as this council would recall. And uh, we felt that it didn't make sense to have a ton of extra parking spaces within proximity to the T, where there would be a long line of people trying to get in there, park their cars, and the owner of the property uh, actually listened to that. And we also said that we were not looking to, and I believe this council 
you know, has been clear. We, we, we are not looking for somebody to add extra parking spaces so that they can rent them mm -hmm. on site for residents. So uh, it, it's important to note that, you know, if given uh, a request for relief, uh, we would listen to a request from relief from two down to 1.5 as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of it. Here's where it gets funky, and, and, and it is 1.75. So if, if, if you ask us in other parts of this, uh, these regulations, generally they say, uh, you know, where the computation of required parking spaces results in a fractional number, the, fractional, the fraction shall be counted as one. So there's some precedence within the ordinance itself, but uh, I, I would just say that uh, we listen to the neighborhood, we listen to the, uh, obviously to the counselors, and we try to get a sense of what is right. Um, many of you that have heard me at different meetings, um, what we're looking to do with developers is keep their parking on their site. Mm -hmm. And that is one of our directives. That's something we feel strongly about. Um, we know that many folks that live in two-family homes, three-family homes, four-family homes are not currently able to park all the vehicles that are produced by that dwelling to, to keep those on site. They were, I don't know, most three-deckers when I grew up, and I grew up in one, mm -hmm. you had a driveway down the side. You can maybe get three cars in, and there might be a little garage at the end that ended up storing the, the, the snow shovels and the snow blower or whatever, or some bikes, uh, usually wasn't even used for an automobile. And when you get onto these sites, occasionally the landowner uh, wants a particular parking space on that site. You know, they want to, okay, you guys park in and I'll park in the back, or vice versa, whatever is decided. So this is what we experience in the two and three bedroom, which is pretty much uh, a great deal of the housing in the city. So as we go through this development phase where the city has had more development in the last few years than it's had in the prior 20 years, um, we're cognizant that one of the requests of this council and of the neighborhoods is please ask them to keep their parking on the site. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I think that that's fair ask. And uh, that has been what we followed for the most part at 1.75 has mostly been rounded up to two spaces. And then finally, just so if, if this was to go to 2.0 spaces, um, and just like if um, somebody wants to, to build, in a, build a bigger spot that they have to get a variance, would it be treated like a variance that they'd have to get, or just be a waiver they would have to get to it'd build be, less? It'd be a less? waiver. It'd be mm -hmm. a waiver as part of the special permit, perhaps, you know, on, on, the, on the project itself. Okay. And, but the neighbors would still have an opportunity to, if they wanted to keep it at 2.0 or if neighbors were actually in support of going to 1.5, they'd be able to give that public. Yes, opinion. we absolutely listen to the neighbors. Uh, and you've all been to the, to the uh, planning board. Uh, we're very anxious to hear what the neighbors say. And uh, we also, again, listen to the council and uh, look for a neighborhood uh, meeting if possible. And uh, those neighborhood meetings held by the councilors are very helpful to us. Mm -hmm. We get input back from both the neighbors and from the counselors that hold those meetings. So uh, it's just a situation right now where at 1.75 per unit, uh, we're, we're going to two in most cases if there was a situation, and there have been situations where they're, you know, they're, they're closer to public transportation. There's always a line and there's always that exact line where that, you know, if you would say a quarter mile away from the T station, mm -hmm. you can be one house in addition to that quarter mile away from the T station. And uh, we could, you know, if asked for relief and if the council and the neighborhood says, you know, we're good at 1.5, we definitely would entertain that and uh, would not be afraid as a planning department to make that recommendation to the planning board. Ultimately, is the planning board that makes the decision. Be clear on that. And at the same time, uh, what we put before the planning board at, at our public hearing was exactly that. At 1.75, there were some questions as to, you know, what the, the planning department was comfortable with. And you heard what we're comfortable with. Uh, it hasn't changed. We think that uh, 
1.75. Uh, I, I don't know what the genesis of that was, whether it was just uh, something that was suggested by uh, Dr. Brabowski when he gave us our, our last uh, update on, on zoning. But uh, I can tell you that uh, our practice has been to go to 1.75. Um, uh, excuse me, go to two if it's at 1.75. Uh, again, we want our, our marching orders and what we hear from the citizenry is keep the projects parked on the project site. The project site. And one last question. I know that it's before us, it's, it came before the council to request for a revisit of the zoning. When do you think that will happen? Just out of curiosity, I, I would defer to uh, to to the mayor's office on that. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's quite an extensive mm -hmm. effort. You all mm -hmm. familiar with? Uh, it takes quite a bit. And when we will do an overview on the entirety of the zoning uh, uh, program, we'll bring in an expert and we'll listen to testimony, mm -hmm. and we'll hear what again what trends are. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that at one point th there was a plan that was presented in Wollaston um, a number of years ago that ad, you know, was, was uh, advocating for 0.5 parking spaces. And I can tell you that uh, one of the developers, uh, Mr. Kiley, who built right next to the Wollaston Wine Company, uh, executed his plan at 0.5. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to him. He's done two other projects in the city uh, most recently. And he laments the fact because he's taken some heat uh, because a number of the neighbors say, you know, you couldn't even give one unit, one parking space to each one of your units. And uh, so where do those parking spaces go? Well, unfortunately, they go into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them were parked at the T station and were willing to pay at the T station uh, for parking. But it had been uh, what we heard from the neighbors, uh, we heard from the merchants, uh, is that that had caused hardship and uh, People had tracked a number of those cars back to the location where the parking ratio was 0.5. So again, I'm not suggesting that that is, that's just the different example at the other extreme. I, I guess, certainly... yeah, no, I understand. And, and the reason why I asked when the zone is going to come back before us is because we're struggling right now as a city is we're trying to grow, economically build, but we also um, went backwards. We, we built and then we went back to the parking stickers and we did the stickers up in Penn Hill area first. And I know that they're also trying to do it over in Ward 3, but we're really struggling with that. I mean, that's something that we really have to have mm -hmm. ironclad figured out before we can really, because you, you, they're parking in neighborhoods and, and we're trying to figure that out, but it's not, it's not done yet. So I'd say that that's our biggest problem is we have to figure that out before we can bring the parking down, but at the same time, if developers can get waivers, because right now we're fighting with each other in the city as to what's the right thing to do. And it's a big struggle, right? There's, there's traffic and we don't know who's traffic. It's cut through traffic. So there's, there's, there's a pointing finger going on and we need to actually hold on and, and actually take account to what we're doing here in the city and take ownership and try to figure these things out. But in the meantime, 1.75 doesn't make sense either. And, and I know many of the developers, they do not like to um, give the parking spaces away with the units because they have them purchased in addition. So even if they're being asked to do that, people do not have to purchase the one or the two that are becoming required with it. The developer has to develop it and some of the cost is being passed on, but they are actually charging for them. They're not, they're charging separate for them. So you can basically you're leasing your space in the building. It doesn't come with the condo unit you're buying. It doesn't come with the apartment that you're purchasing. So they seem to be, the developers seem to be doing fine. I think it's the people who are moving into Quincy that struggle with that. But it's also the people who are currently living here when we're taking down single or double family homes and putting up you know, 10 units and cars are going into our streets. That's what's really happening. So it's really a balance that we have to come into play with here. And you know, with the short period of time between now and doing the zoning, I, I don't know if going up to 2.0 is gonna harm us as much as going down to 1.5, but I do think it has to be a real discussion and it's, the, it's more than just the parking, the building, it's the collaboration of what's gonna happen with the parking and the street permitting and how we handle that as a city as well. We're, we're not there yet either. Mm -hmm. So there's all those things and more that need to work together and currently we're not really gelling with each other for that. So that's my commentary for that, but thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, I do have a few questions for you, Mr. Fatsis, sure. if you uh, could entertain me for a few moments. So I'm just going off of the uh, communication that you sent to us, and in the uh, second to last, or the last paragraph here, it says that the proposed change would likely reduce the density 
of future residential proposals. Um, I don't disagree with that statement because logically it makes sense, right? You only have a certain amount of square footage and depending on how much of that square footage is going to be committed to parking versus the actual units themselves, I could see, you know, given what you could sort of get for return on investments, developers wanting to sort of really maximize that space for residential units versus parking spaces. Um, but could you explain just a little bit further? I mean, it's, it's minimal, right? If we're talking 0.75 to point, for, from 0.75 and then going up 0.25 spaces to two, I feel like, you know, that space, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it seems minimal when you're talking about an overall reduction of a, of, of a development. So could you just explain a little bit further sort of how you got to this? Well, it makes sense the way you said it. I just I want to understand a little bit further what you mean. Again, how how we got to it, the board and and the uh, the planning board, and uh, of course was the council proposed this uh, this change. Uh, I I want to be consistent in what I I tell you. If you come to us and you know you are at one point seven five, um, I've not seen a point seven five vehicle. I've not seen a point five vehicle. It's going to be one or two, and at 1.75, we're generally going to go to two. Uh, again, if there was uh, a request, which does not have to happen often, to reduce the parking uh, numbers uh, by either the neighborhood or the council, uh, we certainly listen. And in the case where we did have that uh, brought to our attention, we did su suggest to the developer to reduce his parking. Uh, you know, and that was a planning board decision. Uh, that was planning board advice, uh, just based on on what they saw before us, as uh, they corresponded to this this body uh, regarding a PUD. So, you know, we provide that information. Uh, we we will offer our opinion, but ultimately, the legislative body makes decisions. Uh, the planning board and the zoning board of appeal make decisions. Uh, we advise in the planning department. And I, again, I can tell you that our practice has been, if it comes before us, it's 1.75. Uh, we're going to round up to two. We're not going to round down to one. And there's no real manner in which to, you know, that's a three quarters of a car. We'd be going in the other direction. So for the 0.25, we're comfortable uh, suggesting it goes to to two, um, it was put before the board. Uh, that was their their impression. Again, I think part of what the board looks at is it's hard to uh, really work in, in uh, with with you know a 0.75 versus a 0.5. You know, it's it's just it, we can call it semantics. We can call it you know you know you're sharpening your pencil. But we generally like to listen to the neighborhoods. And we like to listen to the councils, the councilors, and that's what helps us shape our opinions more than whether it's 1.75 on a piece of paper. We have the ability to offer some relief um, as a board. Uh, we don't often offer relief from 1.75, uh, you know, down to one. Uh, it would be, you know, at 1.5. That I could see it occurring especially if it's more transit oriented. And do you see more requests coming in to increase the parking requirements or to decrease them? From whom? From the neighbors? Yeah. I would say that they would like to see the parking increased in many From developers, cases. I imagine you more often than not developers, see the request to decrease them, correct? You hit the nail on the head. It, okay. it becomes, an, uh, you know, if they've got X amount of square footage, um, that, that actual lot is going to pretty much define how many units they can build because they have to meet their parking <coughs> responsibilities on site. And again, financially, they do want to try to get more units in the parking spaces out of My experience, okay. yeah. And then when you say that you, um, you generally count a fraction as one parking space as the ordinance is currently written. No, I, so I, if you what I said is inside the regulations, there is a line that says required spaces, uh, 5.1.7, and it says buildings and uses in existence prior to the effective date of this ordinance shall not be subject to, um, uh, let me just give it, shall not be subject to the requirements stated herein. All other buildings and uses shall comply with requirements of this section. And then further down, it gets to required spaces, rounding of fractions. It is stated in the ordinance. 
where the computation of required parking spaces results in a fractional number, the fraction shall be counted as one. That's just the standard line, or I won't say standard line, that is just part of 5.1.7. It's in the ordinance. Uh, but again, uh, we have the ability to uh, give some relief, and, uh, and that would definitely be taken into consideration in a situation where we and the neighbors and the council felt there was adequate parking. So if you were at 1.5 spaces per unit, you don't count it until you've, you count the total project, right? Yes. Okay, so if, if, if in total, then it, the number comes to a whole number, you don't round yes. up or round down, and if it comes up to a, a yeah, and, you and don't do it, it per unit is what I'm yeah, saying. Like and, if, and if again, it were 1.5, yes. you don't say, okay, that's two per unit, now move on to the next unit. You count it as a whole yeah, for and the project. I, let me say this too. When we talk about the ability to give relief, uh, it's not been our experience and not been our practice to someone comes along and says, you know, I can build this building, and again, the floor plates dictate how many units can be on the floor. Some floor plates are four units. Some would be six. Very odd for us to see something there. There's an odd number. But if it gets down to that rounding error uh, towards the end, and they're putting in 40 units, and they can't supply, um, you know, 60 parking spaces, but if they could supply 58, uh, we are going to listen to that argument, and we're going to speak to the council, and you know, listen to what the neighborhood says, and uh, that that particular project could be permanent uh, for site plan with you know two spaces less than 60. But again, you will not see us come in and say, well, let's just knock you know 20 spaces off. That's that's not within our purview, and uh, we feel very strongly that uh, you know. Slight adjustments to the parking ratios are acceptable. Uh, a large change uh, is not the spirit of the ordinance as we interpret it. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. I just, again, I mean, I know that you keep going back to, um, you know, the process and, and how important it is that you do really want to listen to, you know, the counselors that represent that particular ward as well as the residents. And, and I've experienced that with you as well when I've had the opportunity to step in for those where, you know, even if it is, just adding that one additional spot that's needed, or you know, if you need to remove it, just that one additional spot. You know, you guys really do listen, and I, I've witnessed that, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but the reason why I was asking all those questions above and beyond that is because I just want to sort of understand, sort of day in and day out, what's the regulatory process right now, and sort of what you see, um, and then we can sort of then understand how big is this impact if we go from 1.75 up to two. Um, and like Council Kroll said, it's almost a matter of memorializing it because in that sense, 1.75, you already do consider to be two spaces. Yes, we um, do. Again, you know, with that being said, with the types of developments that we're getting in and around the area, you know, most of the time when developers are proposing TOD developments to us, it's with this notion of, while well, the majority of folks who live in these units will not have vehicles, will not own vehicles, right? Um, like this place right here across the street and then also the North Quincy development. So, you know, generally they're coming in with this notion of if we're building right next to the train, then more often than not, we're going to appeal to a base that's not going to have a car and not need a car, um, which is great, right? Because you want to be able to have better access. Um, you know, realistically speaking, our, our public transit is not great. And I know that's not an issue that, you know, you're responsible for, but, um, you know, that's, that's, I think, something that we need to also consider for other aspects of the neighborhoods in the city where we are seeing a lot of this development. So, you know, back to what Councilman Mahoney was saying, this is, um, I think on one end for me anyways, it, it is a memorializing exercise because we do go from, you, 0.75, you just round up to the one, the whole of a car, right? And not 0.75 of a yeah. car. Um, but at the same time, if we're looking at it holistically and say this is, you know, the total parking requirements for the totality of the project and we don't look at it per unit, then in the end, depending on the number of units, you could actually siphon off a spot or two, right? And so that does Absolutely. have an overall impact. Um, I think, again, this is a larger issue when it comes to just how we're zoning across the city and the different requirements we're talking about across the city. But I appreciate you answering my questions here tonight. Um, I know we had a couple of other folks come in, so if anybody else has any other questions for Mr. Fatsis? No? Okay. Okay, then at this point I will, oh, thank you, Mr. Fatsis. At this point I will close the ordinance committee meeting at 7.16 p.m. and this item will remain in committee.
Okay. Uh, I apologize. I'm actually, I'm, I think we have enough time to, to start this next item and then we can close it and come back and do it. Um, all right, so I'm going to uh, reopen the Monday, April 22nd meeting of the Quincy City Council. Um, do we have to call the roll again? No. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to move on to the next matter that's um, in today's ordinance committee meeting and that's 2018-101. Ordinance amending Title 13, Public Services Chapter 13.12, Utilities, Small Cells. Um, and again, just how we got here today with this one, the ordinance was advertised back in May 24th, 2018 in the Quincy Sun. Public comment was taken um, on October 29th and there was no formal public hearing requirement, but we did have a public hearing for this matter. So with that, we do have a couple of speakers who are going to speak on this item tonight. Um, I know that we have a little bit of a time crunch, just under 15 minutes, but uh, Mr. Durkin is here from the solicitor's office. If you'd like to just start us off, um, and I know most likely we'll be going over time, so we can end it at 7.30, close this meeting, and then once the regular city council meeting is over, we can reconvene. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good evening, Madam Chairman, members of, members of the council. For the record, Stephen Durkin, assistant city solicitor. Um, so you have before you, um, this ordinance regarding small cell wireless facilities. And I was last before the council um, back in October, and the council had voiced some concerns and had some questions. And in the weeks that followed, I did my best to answer some of those concerns. Um, and ju just, to, just to give a brief history, the genesis of this um, issue was that uh, about a year and a half ago, or perhaps even more like two years ago, um, the city clerk, Nicole Crispo, had received a large number of petitions for small cell wireless placements on public ways. And she um, was made to understand that there, there would be many more coming. And uh, so she sought some input from the solicitor's office and the mayor's staff, and she was looking for uh, to find out what her responsibilities and obligations were under the law, and um, uh, uh, several meetings ensued uh, among the mayor's staff and myself and uh, representatives of Verizon, you know, one of the wireless carriers, and the council president at the time was involved and the city clerk was involved. And what we came up with over a period of time working collaboratively was uh, this ordinance. And what this ordinance does is it takes a, 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 a permit granting process that was, car, was, was then used um, and made it transition over to administrative process where the director of inspectional services would be reviewing the permits and either granting the permits or denying the permits rather than have the council be directly involved in that. So what this ordinance does, um, it creates standards that the council would set standards that would have to be met by the wireless carriers in order to be considered for a permit. And then it would give authority to the director of inspectional services to grant those permits as long as all, that, all, all the criteria were met. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, from a legal standpoint and from a practical standpoint. Um, the city is going to continue receiving these requests for small cell permits, and it's gonna be time consuming. Um, I, and I, I would just add that federal law, the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 and accompanying FCC regulations severely limit and tie the hands of local communities in what they can do. Uh, local communities can't prevent small cells from, from being um, installed. Uh, local communities cannot use public health concerns as a reason for denying permits. Um, local communities cannot um, have regulations that effectively prohibit small cells from being placed on public ways. So um, I, I, thought it, I thought it made a lot of sense for the council to set some parameters and standards and turn over authority over to the director of inspectional services who was probably, I would say, better equipped to deal with these um, on, a, on a fairly rapid basis. And I would also point out, since I was last before the council, um, the FCC has issued further regulations which further limit um, local communities' 
ability to control it, what, what goes on with these small cells. And it also reduced the time period, the time limit that a city has to act upon these permits. It went from 90 days to 60 days. It's called a 60-day shot clock. So from the time a permit uh, is applied for, a city has only 60 days to respond one way or the other, either to grant the permit or to deny the permit with, with good reason. Um, I also have uh, with me tonight uh, Chief Keenan from the Quincy Police Department, and the reason that he is here is to answer any questions that councilors might have, uh, because in addition to the city clerk coming to the solicitor's office and the mayor's office with her concerns, we also received concerns from the police department that we didn't have sufficient cell coverage around the city, particularly in areas in Ward 1 and Ward 6, um, down in Howes Neck and Adam Shore and uh, Post Island and down in those areas. And those became a particular concern on the 3rd of July down in Howes Neck, I understand, and also during um, the March flooding that uh, Ward 1 uh, experienced just a little bit more than a year ago. So these, these gaps in cell coverage were a concern for the police department, and this ordinance would also be responsive to those concerns because the hope would be that the city would act on these petitions um, more quickly. I also have with me tonight Suzanne Condon, um, who's been good enough to work with me on, on these issues. And she's uh, served as a public health consultant for the city, and she does a great job. And she's a tremendous resource and very knowledgeable on the science. Um, I would ask her maybe if she could step up to the podium just to offer to supplement what I've been saying about um, the public health issues and FCC regulations and what the law requires. I want to step up sure. here for, for a moment. Thanks, Steve. Um, Suzanne Condon, uh, public health consultant for the uh, city of Quincy. Um, thanks for giving me a minute to talk. I, uh, I, I, I guess I really want to reaffirm something that Steve said, which uh, I think um, uh, really came as a result of uh, a meeting of the FCC back in the late fall, uh, where they effectively uh, looked at a uh, debate that was stirring across the country and wanted to streamline this process. Um, and so, in effect, one of the things that was clear uh, as a result of this order that went into effect in late January is that public health reasons uh, cannot be used as a justification uh, for any kind of um, uh, distance requirements, things like that. But I have worked closely with the solicitor's office because I believe uh, pretty strongly that by addressing the aesthetic issues, um, which have to do with uh, spacing between uh, antenna locations and within distance uh, to various residence areas, um, that we will effectively uh, address uh, the health concerns uh, that could be raised. I think the other thing that I read in the final uh, uh, work that Steve sent to me um, was uh, something that I think is important as it relates to uh, the current um, standards being used uh, to determine health impacts uh, from radio frequency exposure. Uh, and that has to do with something that uh, some have said uh, represents a somewhat archaic standard that has not been updated uh, since 1996. Um, there are many uh, scientists who are, are asking that that be revisited. Uh, but I think what Steve did in the ordinance as it exists is to basically say that whatever that standard is, going from now into the future, it must be met. Uh, and so if that standard is lowered, is, uh, does become something different, then I think the city is poised uh, to be able to drop that right into the process uh, without uh, any issue. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we also have present tonight um, counsel for Verizon, and his name is Victor Minogian, correct? Now, I haven't been working with Attorney Minogian. I've been working with Betsy Mason and John Weaver um, his colleagues, and he's standing in tonight, but he's certainly very familiar with the ordinance, and he's very familiar with uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and the FCC regulations. 
And um, Verizon has been uh, one of the companies that has worked collaboratively with me on this um, toward a common goal, which is to, to be uh, consistent with the law, to conform with the law, and uh, to create a better process here in Quincy so that uh, the city of Quincy can review these applications, um, the ones that are pending, pending and the ones that, that are coming. My understanding is that there have been some 14 applications already filed uh, by three different companies, Extinet, Verizon, and Mo Mobility, and that it is expected that there are to be as many as 16 others um, in the pipeline. Um, so again, the goal here is to make this a more streamlined, efficient process um, to provide better cell coverage to, to residents of Quincy and to meet public safety needs that the Quincy Police Department has. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Oh, thank you. I'm actually going to, um, out of respect of time, just make sure that we recess this portion, this or recess this portion of the evening, um, and then come back into it. And then that way, when folks have questions for you, we actually do have ample time for your response as well. So, um, with that, I'd like to recess this committee meeting at 7:28 p.m. And then after the regularly scheduled council meeting, we'll come back into this committee meeting. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Monday, April 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Quincy City Council. Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Present. Councilor Palmucci. President Kroll. Present. Nine members. Nine members. We have a quorum. At this time, councils, if you would please join me um, by standing and observing a moment of silence, keeping in our thoughts and prayers those courageous men and women who defend our country. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, for the record, if you please could read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you kindly. And with that, the first item on the agenda. First item on the agenda is a presentation for the new public safety headquarters. I believe Mr. Did you want to speak? Chair recognizes Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Through you, Mr. President. And thank you very much. Uh, good evening, councilors. As you know, I included in Mayor Koch's 2017 capital improvement plan request approved by this body was an appropriation uh, to study the feasibility and the design of a new public, head, uh, public safety headquarters at 1C Street. Um, this was driven, as we mentioned uh, at the time, uh, by one uh, overarching factor, and that is uh, the police station at 1C Street uh, has passed its useful life as a functional facility. Um, couple that with the age also of fire headquarters on Quincy Avenue uh, and the space needs required by some of our other public safety related departments, including inspectional services and the health department, and the space needs of the veteran service department. Uh, an RFP based off of this body's approval. An RFP for design services was issued. Uh, a number of firms applied. A review and interview, a review and interview process was conducted uh, in the firm Kessel Bowes, which is one of the preeminent public safety police station and fire department uh, architects uh, in, in the country. 
uh, was awarded uh, the contract for design services. Uh, at that time, uh, Mayor Koch put together a project team, uh, including Commissioner of Public Buildings, Paul Hines, Director of Operations, Helen Murphy, uh, the Fire Chief and his command staff, the Police Chief and his command staff, uh, as well as the Construction Management and Engineering team from Wooden and Curran, uh, together with the team from Kessel Bowes. Uh, and that started the formal process, which has been ongoing uh, upwards of nine or 10 months uh, relative to programming space needs, uh, meeting with the impacted departments, uh, developing uh, preliminary concepts, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, before we got any further, the mayor committed at the time in 2017 uh, to come back before this body with an update preliminarily on uh, where things stood. So not, nothing uh, formal is before this body. There is no ask, there's no request at this point. This is merely a starting off point for a dialogue uh, for a facility that uh, we believe, the mayor believes very strongly, uh, is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Police Chief uh, Paul Keenan in a second, but there is one piece of uh, this process that I wanted to discuss on the mayor's behalf just briefly. I think at the time, in 2017, we had talked about uh, potentially moving some fire apparatus into the new facility uh, as well. Uh, one of the first things that we did when the project team put together, got put together was conduct a response time study, uh, what it would mean to move uh, Engine 1 and Ladder 1 and Rescue 1 from Quincy Avenue to 1C Street. Uh, and the determination was made fairly quickly uh, that the response times that would be created in some areas of the city uh, would be unacceptable to the mayor. Uh, so what is included in this new facility uh, is the administration of the Quincy Fire Department, but we are not planning uh, at this time to move any apparatus. Uh, with that, following uh, Chief Keenan, uh, who's asked to say a few words, uh, we'll have the team from Kessel Bowes walk through the, the concepts as we have them right now. Uh, Michael McKeon, who's a principal with that firm, Todd Costa, who's an associate principal with that firm, and Luke McCoy, who's a landscape architect with Kessel Bowes, uh, will present and uh, Rounding it out will be uh, Joe Shea, the senior principal at Wooden and Curran, uh, who's helped spearheading this project from an engineering and project management uh, perspective from the city. So with that, with your permission, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to turn it to Police Chief Keenan. Please. Chief Keenan, welcome. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to lend my voice in support of the proposed public safety facility. Uh, by way of uh, history, the building that we're in at C Street, 1 C Street, I'm sure you've all driven by it and some possibly have been in it. Uh, the building is, is, was erected originally in the 20s. Uh, the building was given a redo basically in, in the late 80s and it opened as its present, in its present condition in uh, 1989. Since then, the department's expanded, people have expanded, technology has expanded, and, and we've outgrown that space. Uh, and this building essentially has outlived its usefulness. Uh, we face challenges every day in this building, and I'll just briefly outline some of the challenges uh, that we do face. The handicap access is limited to the building. Uh, if there was somebody that was, uh, needed wheelchair or needed assistance, it'd be very difficult for them to get in to conduct business with the city or with the police department. We've, uh, the, uh, the elevator is also unreliable. Many times the, the elevator is down, so people that need to access the second or third floor perhaps wouldn't be able to do so if they had uh, challenges physically. We've also, since almost day one, those, the building is flooded. It floods, it's interesting, it floods from the top down and the bottom up. Really, the only second floor is probably the only area in the building that doesn't get water. And sometimes that does too because it comes in the windows. Uh, originally, that building, there's been a number of different roofs on that building at a substantial cost. We also have heating and air conditioning issues. Usually, it's really, really cool in the winter and hot in the summer, so it works perfectly. But every day, there's people that are coming in and out of our building uh, to repair it. Uh, it's, it's never the right temperature. On, on a warm, humid day, you know, you wind up being 80 or 90 degrees. On the cold winter's day, you wind up being 60 or 50 degrees. So there are challenges with that. Also parking, if you've ever been to our parking lot, there's, there's not adequate parking for anybody, including people that come in to do business on a day-to-day -day basis at the Quincy Police Department, picking up accident reports, you know, reporting crimes, domestic issues, that type of thing. So there's never enough parking, especially when we do training. We have to do a lot of training that's required 
So anytime we do a training day, we're parking almost behind the DPW. Um, also, the uh, cell, cell block is a huge concern of ours. Every year the state comes in and inspects, inspects the cell block, and when they do the inspections, we almost always fail just because the cell block is old. A lot of the uh, cells are out of service because they can't be upgraded because of plumbing concerns. They don't make parts for some of the, the, um, the, the water facilities that are in there. So every year we get, basically they give us uh, compliance waivers, which isn't the best way to do it. If there was anyone that was ever injured or died in a cell block, that's one of the areas that are generally uh, right for a, for a uh, civil lawsuit. So those are woefully inadequate. Uh, our evidence rooms, our evidence rooms are woefully overburdened. We're busting at the seams, essentially. We're required by law to keep more and more evidence for longer and longer periods of time. Our, our uh, evidence areas are uh, in good repair. All the evidence is accounted for. And we keep it as neat and as orderly as we can, and we have a pretty good tracking system with the evidence, but we're just outgrowing the space. The air filtration systems in the drug room, there actually aren't any. So when we go into our drug evidence room, all you can, if, if they make a seizure, our drug, our drug offices make a seizure of marijuana, you can smell it for days and days throughout the building. And it's really not a healthy or a safe situation. We also have security issues. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the times, the building is almost fully accessible. It's not a secure building. It's not the best situation in light of the way that the world is going, unfortunately, today. Uh, we sp have space issues. We've outgrown the building substantially. A lot of the offices that now are being utilized for different staff members were designed originally as closets. In particular, our IT office, where our IT servers are kept, was designed as a storage closet. It now houses basically all of the infrastructure the critical infrastructure of our IT department. And on a number of occasions, that room is actually fret, fled, uh, flooded and we've lost uh, substir substantial amounts of uh, equipment at a substantial cost. So those are some of the, the just the brief, briefly, some of the issues that we do face every day. Uh, I would invite any one of the counselors to come down at any point in time. I'll be glad to give you a, a tour of the station just to show you kind of the areas of concern and you know what, what I think we need. I think the building is time now for a new building. I think um, it's a good move for the city. I know that the fire department will be joining us down there if this is all approved. The Board of Health, Inspectional Services, and Veterans Services. So it's basically gonna be a facility for all, one-stop shop, and I think it's a major convenience for the taxpayers of the citizens of Quincy, and I think it's the right time to make this move. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce Michael from Castle Boo to, to start the program and outline the process. Thank you very much, counselors. Thank you, Chief. Uh, President, members of the council, uh, my name is Michael McKeon. I'm a principal in Castle Boo's Associates Architects. We are public safety facility planners and have been since 1963. Uh, we've done close to 100 facilities. Uh, most of them, probably 80 or so, are police facilities. Uh, but uh, we have partnered uh, on this project with uh, Bob Mitchell of Mitchell Associates, an old classmate of mine, and also uh, has done, he only does uh, fire station design. He's done 150 in his uh, career. So uh, we have a great team. I do apologize. One member of our team who was going to be here this evening uh, is homesick and watching on TV because she's a city resident. Uh, head of our interior design department and space planner. Uh, she works with Todd Acosta for uh, programming and, and space design. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Todd is gonna begin, and then Luke McCoy, our uh, landscape uh, architect site planner, uh, will follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Mr. President, uh, just to give you a little bit of a preview of the vision that we were looking for here was to build kind of a, a center for the uh, Quincy Police Department, Quincy Fire Department, uh, emergency management, and then bring some of the other services that interact quite often with them, uh, being the, as the chief had mentioned, the health uh, department, the inspectional services, veterans, uh, and some archive. <clears throat> By bringing these all together, we're generating an opportunity for efficiency in government. Um, so I, what I want to do is I'll do a little bit of a summary, seeing as how the chief eloquently basically uh, spoke to the life of the PD. But basically, as summarize it, 
the building itself is beyond its useful life. Um, there's uh, flooding concerns, as the chief had mentioned, which we have some images that will actually show just that. Uh, as you can see, to the left-hand side of your screen is an image of the flooding taking place, and the remedy to that was is the middle uh, fixture there um, to protect the electronics and the server equipment. They basically put a plant pan with a drain pipe, um, temporarily making it a better situation, but it's a, it's a temporary fix for the overall greater problem, as well as some crowding and then some of the uh, uh, site walls are starting to degrade there. Uh, again, more water issues are, are resulting in some of these issues, uh, these images uh, shown through the, the life of the building. The fire department headquarters, um, obviously built in 1963, uh, currently houses both the fire department uh, and apparatus as well as the command administration as well as the uh, fire prevention office. The uh, objective with this is actually to give the firefighters a little bit more space to operate in there by pulling the command uh, administration and the fire prevention office out of that location and getting them down to the, the central uh, C Street site. Uh, it's just to show some examples of the overcrowding uh, with these images here. Fire prevention office is the upper right office, uh, upper right photo that you see there. The emergency management department located in a form of barracks. Um, it basically still will function as an EOC and we're just gonna try and re create redundancy at the, exist, uh, the, the new location when we combine that um, site, uh, combine them into that building. Uh, for health department, the services at the Kennedy Center are, are ever expanding uh, and they just kind of seem to be closing in on the health department. So again, in order to create that level of efficiency and give the Kennedy Center some expand more expansion space, we're gonna pull the health department out of there and move them down to that, the, uh, the central municipal facility. Uh, inspectional services, right now within the uh, building that they share with the DPW, they're spread between four different locations in that building, spread out um, and makes it difficult for that department to, to interact and work together. Uh, as well as at certain points in time, usually the beginning of the days, their counter gets overcrowded. Uh, the, the interaction between the ins uh, inspectors and, and dropping off permits becomes a little bit redundant um, with people in and out and gets a little crowded there. The uh, storage is actually, that, that image is actually a photo from their storage facility is expansive um, and needs a lot of space. And then the uh, veteran services is accessibility issues. Kind of heard that uh, already, but uh, limited to, uh, to limited to no parking available at that location. So what all this does is, is this kind of all comes together as part of our, our interview process with each of these departments, and we develop a space program to try and address all of the needs of each uh, department and make sure that we're um, meeting their missions as well as meeting the, their operations and how they, they want to function through the course of the day. Uh, significant technology improvements, especially within uh, you know, building services, police department, fire services, have evolved that program uh, or those series of programs to the point where you know, 20 years ago we weren't talking about cyber crimes as an issue, but now that's a department that's expanding and is uh, growing quite rapidly. Uh, now, as part of um, myself, I attend the uh, International Association of Chief of Police Conference every year to, to get what trends are taking place within the industry of, of policing. Um, un, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs or drones, is a, uh, a tool that police departments are now, and, and even fire departments are now, are being able to utilize to get better eyes on subjects so that there's uh, needs to plan for items like that into uh, future growth in the buildings, uh, as well as uh, data storage for not only digital evidence, um, reports and record, uh, yeah, records, and the um, cameras throughout the city uh, basically needs to be able to be stored and kept in place. 
So what all of this basically means is uh, your current program areas and then your future growth. So we're almost doubling or a little more than doubling the areas of what you have initially. Primarily that's within the uh, police department uh, and the uh, inspectional services. But uh, and some of it is a lateral move, but that the, you can see from this slide here that there's woefully inadequacies in the, in the spaces for the operations there. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also do a uh, external uh, programming exercise. Uh, we need to figure out to make sure that it's going to fit on the site appropriately. What kind of requirements are, are, are there for vehicles, uh, both person, uh, public vehicles that are coming to visit for daily business, uh, personal vehicles for the staff that are working there, uh, cruisers and, and st uh, city vehicles, basically, as well as any specialty equipment that may have to be on site and how we're going to accommodate those, where they're going to live, whether they need to be secured and away from uh, the public or, or can share with the public. And basically that database comes up to give us the uh, chart that you see in front of you here. Um, this basically, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Mr. Walker, was conducted kind of in, in conjunction with a response time study to confirm whether or not we were gonna need to have any sort of apparatus at that. And by putting apparatus at this site, it doesn't give you any large uh, benefit to a, uh, the establishment that you already have in place, uh, the established response study studies. Uh, with that, I'm actually going to hand this over to Luke to start talking about the campus. Thank you. All right. Um, so concurrent with not only the, the building needs and the uses within the building, but we're also looking at the site and not just parking, but also the egress in and out uh, and the functionality of the site and this building, uh, making sure that we have the public way. Uh, the department staff has a separate entrance that's secure. Uh, how are we securing the site uh, from the public for those vehicles that are stored there? And then also trying not to disturb the um, other functions that are on the site, the DPW and those. So just to orient everyone with the, the map that's up here, I know you're all familiar with the site, but um, this area here is, is the Broad Street. Um, we have the C Street that runs here and the existing police department building is right here on the corner. Um, that's Fox and Field there. Uh, across from it. So um, we're going to keep this same orientation throughout the whole thing, but just so you can orient uh, where it is. Um, as we go through the things that we look at, as I mentioned, where are those egress in and out, uh, the fleet management and the parking that's there, as well as that chart that, that you saw and how we can accommodate those. We also know at this particular site that there's another uh, number of other functions on the site that we have to be sensitive to, including the fueling station and environmental floodplain uh, restrictions that are on it, and then making the grades work as there is a delta between Broad Street elevation and the C Street uh, up above. Um, and then also finally keeping in mind the planned improvements that are right around the site. Um, so again, here it is in, in overall context, just to give you a little bit broader uh, of those things that are around. We have the stop and shop gas station that's directly adjacent to it. Uh, we have the Navy uh, parcel that's above C Street. Uh, Quirk Motors is, is right around uh, below as well. So all of those items that are around and those other adjacent land use and stakeholders are also part of this review that we're making sure we look at that. We're not just looking at the site within a box. Um, and Joe from Wooden Kern is going to talk a little bit about some of the things happening offsite as well. Um, so what we do is we take all of these pieces we've talked about, and I know a lot of that is dry. That's our kind of research analysis, understanding the programming, understanding the existing conditions, and then we start to put all of those together. And that's a majority of the time spent that we've been spending our time working with the department, working with the stakeholders, working with members from within the city, is how we put all those together to make it function. Um, looking at the building with different ways. So here's just an option of, of how it started early in the process. We have a bubble diagram of the site and the adjacencies of how parking and public access work versus secured. And then we start to take the building and we're doing the same thing. Each of those departments and the rooms they need are made into blocks and we start laying them out so that the different functions that need to be next to each other are near each other. And we start laying those out and start working with how many stories is the building, how is it oriented on the site, 
and then finally the overall kind of look of how the building is within context. And you can see this earlier concept was a little bit more of a modern look. One of the other concepts had it here, um, which you can see is a little bit more of a contemporary look. Um, and we continue to go through a number of those reiterations until we get to a plan uh, that works for all of those departments. It works for the site. Uh, it works within the building and all of that comes together um, to formulate where we are uh, today. So I want to walk through a little bit of how all of that program, how all of that assessment came to uh, the proposed plan that's in front of you during this study. Um, so again, here is the, the site. Um, we took into account looking at the uh, mass of the C Street improvements and here again the uh, south, southern artery uh, planned improvements, which we already know are, are underway and being proposed. We wanted to make sure that we accounted for those and we've been in discussion with that. Um, and we took that, laid out all of these pieces into the final site plan um, onto the site, which, which looks like this. And how this would function is coming off of C Street, which is right here, is the entrance into the site. If you come here, you have the public access in to the different departments, and Todd's going to talk a little bit about the function within the building in a minute. Um, if you continue um, through and around to the back, um, there we go. Back here, this is a parking garage as well as at level parking. Uh, that would all be for staff and city vehicles. That's a secure area that is not open to the public and has direct access through the back side of the building. What we've also done, and we'll show as we go through some of the later, is that the first floor, the main level, is at C Street. Uh, from looking at C Street towards the building, you'd have a three-story building. If you were on Broad Street looking at the building through the garage, you'd actually, it's a four-story building. So we've been able to incorporate a lower level onto this side that's accessed in from staff and departments within the building there. So what we've done is really worked in a four-story building but feels like a three-story building from when you're out on the intersection or, or C Street so that it doesn't take over the site, but also fits and allow us to fit the, the other things on site. Uh, maintaining, again, the DPW here, um, the, uh, as well as both of these buildings there, and, and working around those so that their parking lots, their parking and flow through also tie into this new building there so that we're not segregating and making it more difficult for anyone that comes to the site to access all of those. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Todd to walk you through each of those floors. Okay. Get to my notes up here. Um, we understand, based on the monitors and the drawings that were issued, that it's difficult to read these. So we have brought and placed out inside of Gallery B larger boards that actually are a little bit more legible, and you can uh, see this. However, what I will do is, is run, walk through these buildings um, fairly quickly to just kind of pinpoint what the colors are, what they mean, and how the building's meant to function. So we're gonna start out on the lower level. So the, uh, if I can get the laser to work here, C Street is towards the top of the page. Broad Street is towards the bottom of the page. We'll maintain that, op or that orientation all the way through. So at the lower level, this is considered really the staff entry level. They're gonna entry, enter in from the the back side, um, the Broad Street side, and this is primarily a business side of, uh, or staff side of the building. So you have your, your PD facility, which is primarily all in light blue. The green up on the uh, monitors right now is the uh, archive for the building, and the purple to the C Street side of the, of the, uh, the drawing is uh, inspectional services archive storage. There's also, there's a common theme with this uh, lobby area here and basically as we go through the building one thing you will notice that everything to the right side of the uh, of the sheet um, is actually uh, a uh, emergency services wing to the building and everything to the left side of the sheet is a uh, um, municipal function however on the uh, we'll call it the main level or the c street level again your entry in that this point is actually from c street we have a emergency services lobby, which is more of a 24-7. And then you have your you know, municipal lobby, which is you know, more of a nine to five or, or business um, operations, except in the event of uh, evening meetings or something of that nature. So again, taking that same 
you know, atrium lobby, everything to the right in blue is police department. This is really the daily operations floor. This is where the patrol is and the darker blue is actually the detention facility and everything to the left side of that actually in the, in the top side of the screen is um, veteran services and the lower portion of the screen in green is the um, is the health department. Uh, one thing you will also notice as we go through these plans is a yellow spot here and there. These are opportunities for shared functions um, that we want to make sure that we're, we're utilizing an efficiency in the building. So we're not you know, multiple break rooms, not multiple conference rooms or meeting rooms. We're utilizing a, a bunch of efficiencies as, as we can as we're going through this building. If we go up to level two, that is a, again from that atrium lobby area to the right, even though it's in a, in a pink color as the monitors like to show it. Uh, that is the inspectional services, uh, inspections are, uh, so excuse me, investigation services from the police department. And the evidence uh, in the right hand side of the screen, you have the yellow, which is a shared training room. And then the inspectional services, the purple that's to the left side of the lobby here. Sorry for that stumble. <clears throat> And on the, uh, the level three or the, or the fourth floor as we're looking at it from Broad Street, this is really your administrative floor. So you, anybody who's coming up here is gonna enter in through the elevator into a, a uh, lobby area where they could be gathered either from the police department in blue, the fire department administration and uh, fire prevention office in red, or the uh, emergency management department in the dark green to the, to the middle of the page. The purple is the dispatch, to combine dispatch uh, or communications as we refer to it. And again, a shared uh, function on that floor as well. Here's the initial uh, images that we're anticipating for the building. Uh, and as you can tell, the, the plan is to tie this into the uh, gateway to the city development uh, intent. So this pulls the inspiration from the Coddington building um, as we're looking at this. And this lovely slide here is actually a video, uh, which due to technical difficulties is not gonna play on the screens. However, we do have it again with our boards playing out in gallery B. Um, so you're more than welcome to, to view that at that. At this point in time, I'd like to hand the microphone over to- Wanna orient, just, just for everyone's oh, yes. orientation too, is, is these, now you're seeing the models. This is that entrance off of C Street with your back to the cemetery, directly across from the entrance into the cemetery there. So this would be as public coming to this building or to use DPW on the left, this would be the entrance coming into the site and what you would see. You would come in, take a right to enter those two entrances that Todd mentioned for public. If you were staff or have a patrol cruiser or that, you would continue straight and then take a right behind the back of the building where it's a secure parking. Thank you. Now to hand the microphone over to Joe. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, counselors, for having me. I'm Joseph Shea, senior principal with Wooded and Curran. Uh, we are one of the city's owners, project managers for the project. Uh, but we're also uh, have been involved to help with the components that are outside of the building footprint, uh, supporting and working alongside KBA. Uh, when we get to the campus components, um, Luke had mentioned the area stakeholders. Right? There's no way a, a building of this size and magnitude and importance uh, can be placed without taking into account our neighbors. Uh, whether it's the stop and shop gas station, the Navy parcel, Quirk Motors, uh, some of the Broad Street functions, Fratelli's and Roxy's, plus interfacing with the Massachusetts DOT who currently has the two projects that were referenced. A transportation improvement project along Southern Artery and C Street uh, that many of you may be aware of. It's been ongoing for a while. Uh, and a pedestrian safety improvement project along Southern Artery from McGrath Highway to Coddington or C Street. And uh, we all know that corridor very well, and we all know how dangerous that corridor is. Uh, so we've been working with and interfacing with Mass DOT such that in parallel, the programming of this building and, and its concept advancement fits in with transportation improvements in the region. We now are going to start the phase of meeting with DPW to determine 
at a more detailed level how this programming fits in with the future of the DPW site. Uh, as you all can tell from the layouts, uh, this is a very large building. It's already a very crowded site. By virtue of the fact that we need a parking deck, clearly the fleet storage and maintenance is a major factor. And uh, the, anal the analogy that we've commonly used is we, we need to find a way to fit six pounds of sugar into a five pound bag. Right? It is a constrained site. We do have a few challenges and KBA has been very resourceful in trying to solve the challenges directly adjacent to the public safety complex. Uh, we've been working on some of the challenges associated with the greater site. Uh, for example, when you look at the site, uh, we've been working with KBA in talking about doing a two-phased construction. One is constructing the public safety components of the building, or all of the components if you're looking at the plans that were on the right side of the atrium first, then, trans then moving the police station into the new facility, then knocking down the existing police station and building the balance of the building. Uh, doing it in two phases allows us to basically reuse existing footprint from the existing police station, but also avoid the additional cost of having a temporary police station. It can be very significant. Uh, what you'll also notice here is there are a number of existing buildings that are no longer shown in the drawing. The animal shelter is gone. Uh, Father Bill's place with Mainspring is not shown there. Some of the, some of the DPW facilities will be relocated. Uh, we've engaged with a number of the neighbors. We've set up meetings to try to determine if this concept is to advance, how do we make sure that we improve the whole campus and we continue to work with whom are our current abutters. As this project proceeds, uh, there are a few next steps to this update. Uh, we're hoping over the next two or three months to have a number of public outreach and input sessions. Uh, to date, I cannot thank the departments and their staff enough for being patient with their time and very informative. As you can tell from the advancement of the drawings, we've gotten to a very detailed level for the concept, which is wonderful because it allows us to be incredibly focused on items such as, are six report writing stations sufficient? Should there be 12? Uh, we're going to be working with the butters and stakeholders, as I indicated, and we're going to continue to advance the campus layout, working with DPW and Commissioner Grazioso. Uh, so what the council should expect is over the course of the next few months, several public meetings available for all. We wanna finalize recommendations and the concepts so that then we can prepare some costs and designs. Costs have not been developed to date for this building. Costs have not been developed for the site advancements. This is an informational presentation this evening. Uh, we're also going to begin the grant application and funding strategy process as KBA has advanced the program sufficiently uh, that we can seek federal and state grants for this building at this point. Uh, and then we'll be back to the city council in the fall with some additional design input and a funding request. Uh, so with that, I do want to reiterate two items. One is we, uh, for the general public, the drawings are available at the back at a much larger scale. Uh, so following this presentation will be available in gallery A and B uh, to view the drawings and answer very specific questions. Um, also on behalf of Mass DOT, I'd like to send out a PSA that the Mass DOT is holding a meeting on the Southern Artery and C Street project. Uh, they've announced it for Thursday, May 16th at 7 p.m. at the Broad Meadows Middle School. Um, I saw that announcement today. We make sure we get that up through the city's website, but there's a uh, mass DOT meeting coming as well. Uh, so with that, I'll hand that back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Shea. Um, obviously an exciting concept with uh, some clear cut next steps. I also wanted to just note joining us here, the uh, new Director of Health, Ruth Jones, Director of Veteran Services, George Nicholson, and Director of Inspectional Services, Jay Duca. So thank you all for joining us as well. Um, I don't know if the council had any, council of Devona? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I wanna thank uh, everybody here tonight that came up and spoke. Um, just a general uh, comment about everything. This is a long overdue project. I'm actually very happy that it's in the capital improvement plan. I'm looking forward to more discussions on this. 
I'm happy to see a lot of the police department here, fire chief, deputy fires as well in the back ground there. Um, just, just looking at what is going to consist in the building, um, Quincy Police Department, Quincy Fire Administration, Emergency Management Department, Health Services, and Special Services, and Veterans Services. The key component to this is uh, Emergency Management Department inside the same facility. Um, God forbid we have another situation where everybody is there without traveling around the city, almost all the um, the, the head department heads will be in that building, will be able to alleviate a lot of the issues. Um, I have been in the building of the police department a few times over the last few years, I visited, and I could say that the only thing that's good about the building is the workers, the police officers, and the employees. With the exception of that, the building is in terrible, terrible condition. And I will say that um, there's a lot of sections that were patched together and you're just getting by on the skin of your teeth every day. So I, I um, wish this was a little earlier, but I think the timing is right to do this. Um, it also is going to alleviate with the uh, health department over at the Kennedy Center. And the Kennedy Center definitely needs more space for our seniors and our council on aging. So that will alleviate a lot in that building, as well as special services at the DPW department and the veteran services, which is behind the, the police headquarters on that little side street. So I think it's gonna give space for other entities out thri throughout the city and it'll alleviate a lot of issues and problems. The timing of this is perfect, I would say, because with all the downtown development, the new parking garage with 714 parking spaces are coming in. You know, I drive by it every day to and from work and I see it get going up as fast as it can and that'll alleviate a lot. A Wallace and T station, which will be open by the end of August. Um, all the different improvements that have happened throughout the city, it's coming at a good time to, to tailor this in. When, when other towns and cities, I look at Weymouth, Massachusetts, they're having their Union Point, they're having a huge development problem over there. We're having a lot of economic growth. Last year, we were number four on economic growth throughout the, throughout the Commonwealth. 351 um, towns and cities, we were number four on economic growth. This is gonna help alleviate the taxpayers with the funding of the federal and state funding is our economic growth that we're doing in the city to alleviate the taxpayers of the city to pay for this. So um, on top of having new schools, we'll have our third new school on June 3rd, Sterling Southwest. Um, that'll be three new schools in the last nine years. Uh, playgrounds, I mean, you name it. This, I, I spoke offline to Jim Fatsy's a little earlier. We talked about how important it is to live in the city and be a resident today. And I spoke um, at the last meeting about somebody that used to live here. Um, he, he had lived here previously. Uh, he did Beachwood Knoll, he did Central, and then he did North Quincy High School, and then he moved out of the city. And I asked him a simple question, would you move back here? And he said, yes, I would. I know a lot of folks that have left the city that want to come back to the city with all the investments that we're making. This is the next caviar, this is the next phase of doing something that's really great for the city. I, I travel all over, I look at a place like Walpole, Massachusetts, that, is, that just built a police, new police station, new fire station, new DPW and council on aging, they did all four. And I asked the police chief what's going on here. He says it's an amount of people that wanna move here, families that wanna move here because of all those improvements. I think of us as Quincy, Massachusetts, we can do the same thing here. So I'm looking forward to all this. This is positive stuff for the city. Um, this is not a time to be negative, this is a time to be positive about what we're doing here. And um, I'm happy that the mayor and the administration and hopefully my colleagues will be on board with this vision, this vision that we've been speaking about for the last few years. So with that, thank you. Councilor Hughes had her hand up first. See me. It's never hard to hear me, but it might be hard to see me. Um, I just wondered, is it possible to put this on the city website so people could see? I did not hear that. Is that is it going on the website for people? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Council. Thanks. Council Mahoney. I hope this doesn't sound negative because it's not meant to be. Um, could we start by just kind of level setting and um, I'm gonna ask Susan O'Connor just to let us know wh what's the expenses that we've put into this plan so far for the public safety and what has, and what does it entail? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, Councillor. Back in 2017, the Council voted um, on, in, on the CIP Phase 2, and within that phase, there was $500,000 that was voted for the puff, public safety building. I'm not sure if it was a study or a plan. Um, to date, um, $404,042 has been spent. We have 83458 encumbered, which leaves a remaining balance of $12,500. Thank you. So a half a million dollars, and this is a plan, so this is not the full architectural plans for the building, correct? This is just a, a, a study. Correct, this is a study, okay. yes. So that would be phase two to get to the architectural plans of that. So when I'm looking at this, um, I, and I'm glad you did explain, I'm not sure who, I, at this point I don't remember who explained. I was, the first thing I was, I was flipping through, I was questioning how are you going to do it because you're building on top of the current police station. But even still, where you're building phase one, you have, I'm just trying to figure out how this is going to function, the police station can function when, um, you know, we have emergency vehicles that need to get out to to go to the public, where are they driving out of? How are you managing the flow that's going to have to work within the current you know, the current um, station? Correct. So, as part of a feasibility study, mm -hmm. um, we look at that, but only again in the big picture conceptual level. If this project were to move forward, and this is part of that next phase that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. is doing a detailed phasing, which includes the construction plans and how that would work in and out. Yeah. Uh, of that facility. So there would be temporary egress and exits um, and, and that nature throughout. Um, I guess when you look at it, we knew what the site was going to be, and I understand what you're saying, but really what you're giving me is a pretty picture and not a functional police station because we're going to build on top of a police station, and that makes it very difficult, and we paid a half a million dollars to not get that answer. And I know you have to build out the plans to actually build the building, but putting it there and saying that's phase two, we've spent a half a million dollars to show you what we think it can do, that's concerning to me, because no, that would be it, part it, of it. No, it, it does work with what's there. That There's two different questions you asked in regards to the phasing well, phase one's being built, would the existing facility be able to function? And the answer is yes. The exact details of exactly where a construction entrance versus the PD department exit would be, we don't have because we're not as far with those plans under this phase. Mm -hmm. But we do know that the ability to build that building as shown on the site plan under phase one without the addition piece that goes under phase two on the left side can fit. There's plenty of separation. The two grades work. We can move um, equipment and or um, people in and out vehicles in and out of the site concurrently while building that. So what would happen is that first phase, what would house the new public safety portion that the PD would be built. They would be able to fully move over into that, including the garage in the back, move all of their uh, vehicles, the staff entrance, all of there. Then what would happen is the existing PD would come down. That part that is on the left side of the building would then be built, which houses the other functions that are not tied to the PD. Okay. So they would function concurrently, and then you'd move over. And as Joe mentioned, the plan was why we looked at that was the increase that it would cost the city to temporarily relocate them. No, I understand that, too. I, I understand that that would be a very expensive ask for the city. And um, just for the record, when anybody says campus, when we talk about campuses as a taxpayer, it just makes my back of my head think, how much is this going to cost me as a taxpayer? Because expanded campuses, it's, it's an expensive building. And I, I'm not trying to be you know, negative here. I'm just trying to say, like, you know, this is a very expensive building, and, and it's, it's it's a, it's a tricky word, campus, when you say that, because it just makes it sound like we're building, like, gigantic things for... <laughs> it's yeah, it, it is, and we run into that all the time, especially when you're doing campus planning on a, on a, uh, a college-type campus versus a municipality, where we're looking at a municipality, it's actually a benefit because it is typically one building, and as Todd walked through, we're sharing a number of spaces. No, so I understand that. I understand that, but, but, but like I said, it's, it's a... It's a it's not so much a change for the fire or the other locate the other locations that you're going to build pull together into this one building, but the police department in itself, and it's a tough location. So, to get back to some of the other questions, when when this is being shown, where would when the building is built again, where would the um, the emergency vehicles be exiting from onto C Street or onto Broad Street? I mean, onto Southern Artery, I guess. <laughs> Trying to get to the site plan, but but they exit currently right now into the intersection, and, and that would remain um, where they do. Um, so they would have the ability to, again, 
function uh, right into that area because <coughs> under the first phase, this whole corner uh, that makes uh, almost a triangle uh, is outside of the first phase of that. So all of that would function and it would be operational. Um, the timing of the lighting and things of that may be changed, but the end, the idea would be that they'd still be able to function as they do right out there. So when it's all, when the campus is all done, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be like they'll exit, right now they're exiting on the other side of the gas station, correct? They're actually, um, they have an exit, uh, this won't work right here, above the gas station. Yep. yep. So, so, and then in the new, in the new plan, it would be exiting in the same place once the building is completely built. In the new plan, um, they actually have the ability um, and are coming off of Broad Street okay. here, and then there's a secondary entrance there as well. So one of the question, one of my questions I'd have is because um, I know they're going to be doing some work to those roads, but is that you know in a perfect world is that a dangerous um, exit path for uh, an emergency <clears throat> vehicle pulling off? into the southern artery. It's a very tricky corner and it's got a lot of traffic. I, it's just, it's, it's basically a problem with the, the site location currently, but I'm just asking, you know, is that, what, what, was, what did you learn in the studies about the location of the current yeah. building in that? I, I would like to just point out that the police respond from their vehicle wherever they are in the city. No, I understand that. They don't necessarily come out of uh, the site uh, altogether. So it's occasional, it's not like, uh, that might be a problem, certainly would be a, a more difficult problem if we had uh, fire apparatus on the site and we're trying to exit into those. No, I understand that the police very, very often respond to from the locations that they are um, dispatched throughout the whole city, but I have actually seen them also at a rapid speed have to leave that facility. And to take that into consideration is something that I would, as a city councilor, as I'm, as I'm sitting here tonight looking at a half million dollar plan, and I'm asking you know, whether you think one or two, but that's an area that we have a lot of people that we're paying a lot of money for talking about this. And I'm asking, what is your opinion of that? Because it's a dangerous street. I mean, we have uh, Joe Shea Jr., you're here. And there's, we get a lot of extra help here. And you know we have two locations that you could have them pull out of, and you're going to have them continue on to Broad Street. If you're saying that that's not a problem, I've seen many a times things almost happen there. And you know I don't want to see a police officer hurt, and I don't want to see a pedestrian person hurt. So that's it's just I've seen it happen, and you know I'm not down in this particular area all that often. So if I've seen it happen, it's it's something that does happen. So we, we do believe that what we're proposing resolves it in a safe way. Results, or does it continue just to have the same result? Is that is that your feeling? Is it's? Sorry. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, you're, you, you kind of said that it does it doesn't happen that often. So it's not. Is it something that was taken into consideration, or you think it's just still safe, or is the street going to be safe? Is the exit path? We, path we believe be safer? what we're proposing is a, it will be a safe solution, and as we get into more detail, mm -hmm. we can be more uh, well. We can show you more detail about exactly how that will happen, but we believe moving farther down, coming into Broad Street. Uh, instead of going out near the, you know, in front of the gas station, uh, will help resolve a lot of that access problem there, okay. uh, and and it's a safe done in a safe way. Yeah. It wasn't highlighted in your presentation, so I was just curious. Um, let's see, I know I had one other question. So one of the things that we said too towards the back of the presentation. Um, I don't really think it looks anything like the Coddington building, but that's just me, because the Coddington building is a, is a historic, beautiful building, and it's very hard to kind of mimic that look. It just looks like a giant brick building, but um, that's just my opinion. Um, you're saying it will start in the spring or summer of 2019 will be the, the outreach. Some of the locations that are, that are mentioned here, what, I don't know who, if there's anybody up here, or if it has to be um, Chris that would answer this question. Are, what's the plan for that, those locations, and has the, has the city acquired those areas? It looks like your Father Bill's, the animal shelter. Is there any other locations that were mentioned? There was another piece that was mentioned somewhere. So what is the plan in those areas, and, and what are the next steps for that? Through you, Mr. President. Uh, clearly, it's no secret here because there's a parking structure mm -hmm. on top of where Father Bill's currently is, uh, is that facility would need to be relocated. Uh, that's the one, uh, actually there are two, uh, the VFW Bryan Post, uh, which has been included in previous capital plans uh, for acquisition. Um, that has, uh, that will also be implicated in this. Those are the two uh, pieces of property that are currently implicated. Um, Father Bill's, the, the plan would be to relocate uh, in that general vicinity. 
uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, and Father Bills has talked about uh, its long-term goal, its long-term game plan, uh, about changing up its operation uh, to be more of a uh, full-day uh, housing resource center uh, where clients are in the program all day uh, it, with fewer uh, emergency shelter beds. Um, they're changing the operation a little bit. Um, they've, they've announced that previously. Uh, they're continuing to work through that process. Uh, but clearly, as you see in the map, the two things that are absolutely implicated here are the Bryant Post and Father Bill's Place. Uh, beyond that, we have a lot of discussion uh, that needs to take place. Are those acquisitions, or how would that? Bryant Post would be an acquisition, yes. It's been included in previous capital plan acquisition requests. Um, sort of been out there to, to be talked about. Father Bill's Place is actually owned by the city. Uh, so that would not be an acquisition as we already own it. Okay. Will the city then help relocate them? Is that? We would. Okay. And when do we when do we anticipate the expense for um, this building? You know, we we're talking about grant applications and final recommendation for concepts in the fall of 2019. Do we have an Do we have an, any idea how much an <gasps> estimate, a ballpark I'll, estimate that this would cost? I'll take that one, Mr. President. Uh, no. Uh, we're, we're programming uh, at this point, and we'll be back before this body uh, with a number uh, and a full uh, project budget uh, when that project budget is, is fully developed. Um, we're not going to put any uh, timeline on it. I'm not going to provide any dates uh, from our perspective on when this absolutely positively has to be back before this body. Uh, but the mayor and his team are committed to, to seeing this through. So I think it's safe to say that you know, as soon as we can get uh, a process completed uh, and a project uh, with that meat on the bone that you require in terms of the funding uh, ready, uh, this, this body will see that proposal. And then out of curiosity, I'm just, I understand, um, I understand, I guess I'm trying to figure, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure this all out because we have Joe Shave from Woodward and Current. How does that fit into this particular plan? And, and I'm just, if you could help me piece together that, because we we just got the pricing from Sorry. Susan O'Connor, and I think it, 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 I'm sure that there was probably a portion of that. Was that part of the half a million dollars would would incur, and it's it broken out to that detail? I have to. Under, and Joe can jump in here if he feels uh, necessary, uh, but through you, Mr. President, uh, under any project of this magnitude, uh, virtually any project of this magnitude, in addition to the architects who do the designing, uh, we have an owner's project rep manager um, that oversees uh, the day-to-day -day and the week-to-week -week, uh, process with the project. Uh, Woodard and Karen works with the city on a number of projects. They are, quite frankly, the best in the business when it comes to this. Uh, we're very happy to continue the relationship that we have with them, both on an owner's project manager status in, in many projects and other projects uh, as primary engineering firm uh, on others' uh, construction management uh, projects. Uh, we've had a great experience w with the firm over the years, uh, and a project of this magnitude uh, absolutely requires an owner's project manager uh, as part of uh, even this early stage. Yeah. And this was not meant to be, I'm just trying to piece it all together, because mm -hmm. there's many projects that you're on, um, Jeff, and you, you, you seem to, you're in every project that we have, you're here on, and it's it's just, that I'm trying to understand how it all works. And you know, you talk about DBW, you're here. You talk about traffic, you're here. You talk about development, you're here. So, uh, and I know, I'm just out of, out of curiosity, just, if you could, just out of curiosity, how do those contracts work? Do you, are they separate from, are each project separate or is it one big Woodward and Curran project plan? <laughs> um, the projects are separate. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we were selected as the owner's project manager. Mm -hmm. So a, a portion of that uh, CIP appropriation was used to get us under contract. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way the puzzle pieces fit together for clarity, um, KBA is an excellent choice for the public safety complex, mm -hmm. all the moving pieces with public safety, EMS, fire departments. Uh, knowing how this was going to interface with the neighbors and with DPW, mm -hmm. uh, we have provided some additional technical support dealing with the, the term campus that you brought up earlier from our presentation. Uh, so they can focus on architecture, the building, the fleet, and the programming of the site, and we can provide support with how it plugs into the neighborhood mm -hmm. and interacts with other departments that aren't in the building. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All set, Council? 
Thank you both. Council Yang, McCarthy, and then Palmucci. Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have a couple of questions. Um, I do want to just start off by saying that I am, am really looking forward to this. I think that, you know, given the number of departments that will all be consolidated into one place, it's going to be um, not only increasing efficiency, but I think uh, increasing the, the level of service that all the residents in the city are going to get provided to them. Um, I mean, between all these different departments that are going to be headquartered together, uh, you know, I've been to, to the majority of them more than um, a handful of times. And, you know, sometimes driving from one side of Quincy Shore Drive to the other, depending on the time of day with traffic, um, is excruciating. And so to begin, be able to have all these departments together, I think, is going to really increase the efficiency of all these departments working together and collaborating. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, that being said, though, we did talk uh, earlier about how we're going to maintain operations for the police department, which, of course, is essential. But again, looking at the number of departments that are all going to be consolidated here, I just want to also know how you guys are going to be working with all the other departments to make sure that they're going to be up and running consistently throughout this project phase. So I don't know if the two of you can talk about that. You, you had talked about the, the plan around the police department and making sure that that is maintained, which of course is essential, but these other departments I think also have um, you know, important roles to play. And so I just wanna make sure that you, know, you guys have a plan in place for those other departments as well. Are you working with the department heads on that? We are, um, so three, Mr. President. The um, overall, the reason why we talked phasing relative to the police department, because the building goes right adjacent to them on their site. Everybody else is, even though the inspectional service is located within the building on the same already established campus, they're in a separate building. They're far enough away from the, the construction phase um, that they won't be affected except for ribbon cutting day and hey, it's time to move in. So that's really how, kind of how that those other services are going to interact is um, phasing wise is they'll be just basically either pick up their files and, and items that they're bringing with them on move-in day, um, both of the fire department, um, the uh, Office of Emergency Management would be part of that first phase. So basically when that ribbon cuts, so to speak, um, they come in and they establish and they work. It's literally they just pull out of one place and, and sit down in the, in the new location. The other departments just have to wait the duration longer to finish the, the second phase of construction, which would be demolish the existing PD building and build that back up with the new uh, municipal side uh, of that. And have you already talked to, uh, getting up to this point, again, I know this is very early on, it's very preliminary, but have you already worked with all the different department heads to sort of get to the space and understand, you know, how long will that changeover take and how much time do you guys need? And just, again, understanding what that looks like for the different departments. We've talked with all the department heads to, to establish that programming function. And then, you know, yes, initial concepts of, of how long it would be to move them over, but not in depth. That really needs to come in late, later phases when you get either a construction manager or, or a, a contractor on board so that we know exactly where those. Yeah, I just, I wanna make sure again, there's no disruption of service because I think, you know, outside of the essential services, these other departments are also, I think, um, it, it's necessary for them to be open and up and running every day, particularly when we're in this phase of huge development and going across the city, whether it's a single family home, somebody looking to renovate, or there's a larger development. I just don't want there to be any interruption of service to our residents uh, for any of these departments, right? And so I just wanna make sure that they're all, you know, being treated equally and that they all get the same care and attention um, to make sure that they're, you know, getting their spaces built out accordingly for what their needs are going to be. And that also they're going to be, um, you know, big lines of communication between the departments as well as far as how that's going to um, work with the transition. And so speaking of communication, I'm not sure this is going to be in your wheelhouse. It might be um, in Joe Shea's juniors. We, um, in these slides had talked about briefly timeline and what it looks like between now and the fall. And in that process is going to be public outreach and input gathering that's going to happen. So I would just like to know, again, in the interest of, of keeping lines of communication open and making sure that not just the folks who are going to be affected by it, you know, by working in these departments, but also residents in the area and in the city and then us as well, um, who's going to be doing that kind of public outreach? What does that look like? What does the input gathering process look like? I just want to know from soup to nuts, you know, what we should expect and what residents should expect from that process. Um, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, our goal was to lay out either either three or four meetings. Uh, we assume there may be a ward meeting, a neighborhood meeting, uh, given what ward it's in and the proximity of the ward, and then hold at various locations around the city meetings for people to come 
after they've had time to digest the, the significant content you've seen tonight, because looking at these drawings, there's, there's a lot on them, um, to receive input about it. Then in parallel, so Wooden and Curran as OPM would lead those. In parallel, KBA has been meeting with department heads and with the staff from the departments, and those meetings will continue as we refine detail, as we refine operations. Uh, some of your great questions about the eventual transition plans uh, will grow out of these ongoing meetings. Um, this is a, the first presentation as part of a, a long methodical process to get the right building and to transition properly so that it's smooth for, for the many people involved, but also the, the 90,000 constituents in the city of Quincy. Uh, so you can look and be aware for a chain of presentations over the next few months and, and public meetings around the city. I appreciate that. And that'll be coming directly from Wooded and Kern. Do you have somebody in mind already who's going to be sort of the, the main point of contact, the liaison for either ourselves or residents or, again, staff members, folks who just say, who's that one person I need to go to consistently to make sure that I get the right answers? And if I have any questions, who is that going to be you or someone in your department? Um, it'll actually be... We'll, It'll come through the administration, but it'll be me and my staff and uh, Holly Roach, a Quincy resident who's been uh, handling a lot of the coordination as well, will be the, the two key contacts. I'm sorry, so who are the two key contacts? Myself mm -hmm. and Miss Holly Roach, uh, who's here with, his, with us this evening. She's a Quincy resident who works at Wooded and Curran. Great. Again, I just think that's helpful because there's going to be so many moving parts for people to just understand there's one or two single points of contact. And as this thing continues to grow, they'll be able to have access to that person consistently for information when they come back to it. So uh, you said there's going to be around three to four meetings happening over the course of what I imagine is the summer, because based off this timeline, we should see something um, more substantial back in front of us in the fall. Correct. So this will take place over the course of the summer. Uh, that is correct. We'd like to actually get the first one toward the end of May uh, before the summer session um, given hopefully we can garner much momentum coming out of tonight's presentation and okay I just have a request for you for the meetings if I could um, since again this is going through uh, not your department your, your company I apologize if you could just provide um, at least I want to say and this can change based off my colleagues and I, I welcome their input but in the past when you know public meetings have come up or community meetings have come up and we've gotten a week or a week and a half notice, it was pretty upsetting and, and kind of frustrating trying to make sure that the residents knew in that week's time and making sure that they had an opportunity to attend. So if we could at least get, you know, two, two and a half weeks notice at a minimum, more than that would be great. That would be phenomenal. And then the places that you're posting it, again, just making sure you're working with the papers, making sure that you're using social media effectively. I know you said you're going to be working with the administration. They've been really good on social media. So just making sure that all of that is out there, um, that we get notice on that so that we can share it with our constituents as well. Um, and even above and beyond that, if you have, and I know you've worked with us in the past on doing this, but providing notice in multiple languages would be really helpful as well. Um, I think, again, just given the number of departments and city services that will be affected by this, I think if we can get the word out um, in as many ways as possible, it'd be really helpful. So if you could just make sure to do that for all of your meetings, that would be great. We'll do great, great input. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Yang. Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just a, a quick comment. I, I got privy to this uh, a couple of weeks ago as it's in Ward 1. Uh, there's going to be a lot of action in Ward 1. Um, Joe mentioned, Joe Shea mentioned tonight about uh, Department of Transportation with uh, their work uh, on, on C Street and the intersection there at uh, Southern Artery, but also we're going to have work uh, up the street at Quincy Shore Drive at the Fox and Hounds intersection. So it's going to be a... Um, a very busy time. From what I, I was able to um, see a few weeks ago, and, and again tonight, I was able to sit with the mayor because I, I had some concern when they were going to roll this out. Uh, so I got a sneak preview on some of this. And um, as we all know, I don't think even with the, the questions that are being asked about funding and, and avenues of how we're going to go about that, and um, it's well overdue. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's going to argue with anybody up here. The condition of the police station has been horrific for many years. Um, the services that, that these guys that are sitting out here should have should be A++. And um, we don't have it today. And I think that um, the thought process of, um, as you look at some of these pictures, especially the inspectional services picture, which has a very well-organized 
filing system down there I can see. Um, no, 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 <laughs> no shots at you, Jay. Uh, but um, it's well overdue to get inspectional services, health, emergency management, um, and everything in into a new building. And uh, also at the same time, give up uh, some probably well needed space at 55 C Street. Um, we talked a little bit a few weeks ago about uh, the campus, about um, Broad Street in general, knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a busy street, but I, I honestly think, I, I totally agree uh, with the gentleman tonight that the, uh, the redoing renovation of Broad Street will make a much better um, parking location for, for the officers uh, in regards to all the activities they get into and we get away from coming out in front of the stop and shop gas station that has been there for a long time but is hazardous, hazardous also when people don't respect that entrance and block that entrance and we run into issues there. I think most people have gotten used to the blue strip out on Southern Artery but they still have issues. Um, I'm in full support of, of, of the whole project, bringing all uh, those uh, services down to the police station. And also, it, it seems like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but it seems like the same pattern we've used with Quincy High and Sterling, where uh, we've brought the principals in from day one. We've talked about what matches up in regards to the educational setting. And I compare that with the chief here that I know has sat with the mayor and gone over how logistically it's laid out uh, in this format so that uh, things are where they should be. Things are on that main floor or that lower level for a reason or on that upper level for a reason. So um, all good, um, good items. Um, it, it's great that we're able to do this and I, I commend the, uh, the mayor and his staff and uh, but we're moving forward and, and, and looking at um, all the issues that we have, especially this police station that is in dire need, uh, way overdue to, uh, to get an update. Um, I look forward to chatting with everybody about the different avenues that we're going to talk about. And I'm sure things will change within the plan. I'm sure there's suggestions from the workforce to the chief, the chief to the mayor and back and forth a little bit on making sure we get what we need in, in the layout. And uh, as again, Ward 1 is um, a busy place. And I'll see a lot of Joe Shea, uh, which is a good thing, because he always comes to the table uh, and he does his homework. So uh, um, along with um, the folks from uh, KBA. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council McCarthy. Any further discussion? Council Palmucci. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation, um, folks. I, I, I don't dr test drive a car without looking at the sticker first. So I think it's a little weird that we're, you know, that we're seeing a plan before we see a price tag. Um, you know, I think we all know there's a, a great need for a, a new public safety uh, complex. I don't think there's any question about that. And this is certainly <laughs> looks like it would be a nice one, um, but. I immediately flipped to the back page to look for a price tag when the presentation started and I didn't see one. So you know that means it's going to cost quite a bit. Um, now I take that into consideration that it's, you know, the police station that's built there has been there for 100 years, exclamation point, um, that you would think that the next one's going to last just as long. So when we do get a price um, or a cost, Mr. Walker, I would like to see um, some analytics with that, perhaps a, um, a cost per square foot in terms of uh, comparing this project with other municipal projects, whether it's in Quincy or elsewhere, to get a sense of, uh, you know, it's very similar to what we did, I think, with the dog park uh, and the animal shelter, um, which was get a sense of what the, you know, what the various A, B, C, the gold standard, the silver standard, the bronze standard. Um, just to have that in terms of our um, deliberations for when we do get the the, the sticker on this one. Um, Councilor DeBonis told me that the inside of the cells are just terrible. The police station, 
we clearly need to uh, uh, to fix that up. But it, it really comes down to what we do up here is in spending money is we set the priorities of the city and what we spend money on as a city, the administration and the city council uh, and the school committee for that matter, uh, it sets our priorities. And we've we've been investing in our education systems, our, our schools, we built brand new schools, we've re renovated this historic chamber, um, we've invested in veteran services, spent money in showing our priorities in uh, substance abuse prevention, uh, some of the things that we've done in, the munici in this municipality, in the city, uh, are very forward thinking. And I think what, and the way we need to look at this is, it's a priority. Where is public safety in our grand scheme of priorities as a, as a community? So uh, I say that, you know, and I offer my support of, of this endeavor, knowing full well that I'm not going to like the price, but it's going to be something that I think you just have to swallow. Um, because there is such a need, it is so important. We expect a lot from our public safety folks. They're well-trained professionals, um, and they need a facility that allows them to do their job effectively in the 21st century. And that was a that was a, a big part of of uh, the new school buildings that we built was bringing them into the 21st century and allowing uh, technology to be utilized in the classrooms that wasn't able to be used in prior buildings because of the limitations of the infrastructure. So, I mean, I look forward to, to seeing what the price tag is for this, but um, I certainly will weigh this project heavily uh, in favor of showing the appropriate respect that we have for the contribution that our public safety officials make um, to the city. And knowing that they're working in conditions that are, uh, I'll put it, little more mildly than I think what the chief did, but th that are less than ideal, you know? Um, they're, they're less than ideal, and I don't think they show that, I don't think they show Quincy's commitment. You take a tour of the police station, inspectional services, the health department, veteran services office. I don't think those are accurate reflections of where the city as a whole ranks the importance of those um, those services and the jobs that folks are doing. So I look forward to, the, I look forward to seeing the, the price tag, but um, I weigh that against the, the heavy sentiment of showing the appropriate respect and allowing people to do a very, dif very difficult jobs all around, uh, you know, at the health department, inspectional services. I, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to do Jay Duca's job, I'll tell you that right now. I'm gonna deal with people like me and McCarthy and Kroll. Um, so, yeah, right, right. Uh, I could do your job easily, though. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, you know, it's about showing the proper respect, and it's about giving people the tools to do the job we expect them to do and to do it well. So um, I would just make that, that request, Mr. Walker, that we get some sort of um, analytics in terms of cost <laughs> per square foot of the building, uh, cost per employee housed, that kind of thing. I'm sure if, if, if you guys are experts, uh, I'm sure you are experts, but if you build other public safety um, facilities that we can, we can tease out the, the police and fire sections and compare that to other projects that you've done so that we can get a better sense of um, where we are at in terms of the cost per uh, variables in the project. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Casa. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I just add one more thing? Um, I do like that we've incorporated inspectional services and health department and, and, and other public safety uh, departments and agencies in this complex. I would also like to see the K-9 unit put into the police station. I would think that that makes more sense than the uh, putting them at the animal shelter when that was one of the significant cost drivers when we got the presentation about the animal shelter. And I know the administration um, will be coming back to the council for uh, further monies to complete the animal shelter uh, with, an, with some additional planning. I, the, I think it was like the gold, the platinum standard is what we were showing before, and I think we asked for a gold and a silver option. Um, but the, moving the canine unit into the public safety complex might 
might be a better and more cost effective um, mechanism to house uh, that important function that we have in the police department. It's the, I, I'm, I'm gonna guess that this budget, I'm not gonna guess at the amount, but the addition of adding the canine uh, facilities to the public safety complex will be, I expect, a far less percentage of the total budget than it is at the animal shelter. So it might might make sense to do that. So it, um, the fact that it's not in there, I suggest that this isn't, that we weren't presented this, this plan to weigh in and make changes. It, it, this is probably how it's going to be, but I, um, I will have some questions about that. And I would like, if the canine unit is not going to be in the public safety complex, I'd like a good explanation as to why it isn't when, when the costs come back for either one, whichever one comes before us first. The, the funding for the dog, uh, the dog park and the animal shelter and the funding for the public safety complex. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. Any further comments from the council? Okay, seeing none. Thank you for the presentation. Huh? I said both. Okay, Council Mullen. I'm sorry, I just it's just a follow-up question. So and I appreciate the fact that we were talking about what we're gonna be doing over the summer and just a clarification clarification again to Susan O'Connor. Uh, I think you said that we have remaining twelve thousand dollars in the budget. Yes, we do. We have 83458 which is encumbered purchase orders. Mm -hmm. And then after we take out that, we will have a remaining $12,500. So that will, will that cover, will this cover everything that we're doing all the way up until the fall for the, or is there, or for the summer, for the, the meetings and everything else that we're doing? Will that $12,000 cover it? Half a million dollars. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so awarded and current is in that encumbered but unspent number, so we we do not need access. So we're not anticipating any. So until until we come back with the fault with the number for how much we think it's going to cost, we think that's where it's going to be, right? Correct. From awarded and current, that is correct. And again, this is this is just out of curiosity. Could I get the breakout, Susan, of of the expenses that were paid to um, Woodward and Current and to the architect that did this plan? Um, just so that I can see how the breakout works. And again, yeah. and, and if I could, I'm gonna ask one other thing for this council, just so I can understand it too. Could I also just have an audit of all of the Woodward and Curran um, invoices and the projects that they work on so I can be more educated as to what their roles are? Yes, you can, Councilor. Thank you very much. Turn the microphone. Thank you very much for the presentation. Obviously, based on the timeline, which profiles next steps, uh, we'll hear more about this in the ensuing months. With that, Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda. Number two, 2019-071, an appropriation for $2,231,933.10 for the Quincy Police motion Department. Pro motion made by Finance Chair Kane to waive the reading on the motion, Councilor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, so. This is a request from the mayor's office and it's representing uh, the conclusion of a long time legally binding arbitration between the uh, Quincy Police Patrolman's Association and the city. Um, so this tonight is a request for $2,231,933.10. Um, this will come from free cash, which currently has a balance of almost $2.9 million. So we'll be left with around 640 afterwards. So uh, everyone should be in receipt of a memo from the mayor's chief of staff regarding uh, this retroactive pay. And I wanna thank uh, the chief and members of the police department for being here. I know this has taken a long time to conclude. So with that being said, motion to approve. Motion made by Council Kane to approve, second by Council DeBona. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Crow. Yes. Nine members. Nine members voting in the affirmative. The item passes. Just again, want to thank uh, members of the Patrolman's Union for joining us here this evening. We certainly recognize the uh, ultra complexities that have taken place with your job, particularly over the last few years. So thank you for all that you do in terms of protecting the uh, citizens of Quincy. We greatly appreciate it. Next item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. Number three, 
Motion made by Council Kane. Away the reading on the motion, motion Councilor. Accept the gift and send uh, thank you notes to all the donors. Motion made by Council Kane. Just gonna second by Council DeBona. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Krull. Yes. He remembers the item passes. Next item on the agenda, please. Next item on the agenda. Motion to waive the reading. Number four. Motion made by Councilor Kane to waive the reading on the motion. Motion to accept the gift and send a note of thanks. Motion made, seconded by Councilor DeBona. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. President Crow. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. The item or the gift is received. Number five on the agenda, 2019-074, a revolve supporting MICDI, Indian Nation Government's Preservation of Indian Burial Grounds to Long Island. Council Harris. Council Harris. Thank you, um, President Kroll. Uh, first off, I'd like to acknowledge um, a few people who, who are here tonight. Um, uh, Jean-Luc uh, Pirait, uh, President of the North American Indian Center of Boston, uh, who addressed the, uh, this body uh, on April uh, 1st. And of course, Gary McCann, policy, policy consultant for the MICDI. Um, thank you for being here, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, your help, uh, and thank you for uh, you know uh, being on the. We're we're on the same team, uh, but not quite on the same team. But we're, we are. We're, in, we're it's all the right direction. Councilors, on April first, uh, we heard some uh, very compelling testimony um, from several members of different um, members of uh, Indian nations with regards to possible atrocities with respect to the desecration of Indian burial grounds. I bring before you this evening a resolve asking this council to reach out to various public officials and government agencies as a body so that history does not repeat itself on Long Island. Helping the fight to preserve the Indian burial grounds on Long Island is, is simply the right and decent thing to do. Some concerning um, information um, was raised. I raised at um, the meeting uh, in Dorchester with Boston had for an informational meeting, which they held in Dorchester, not in Quincy. Um, uh, in so many ways uh, was when um, it was two weeks ago tonight, uh, the question was asked if it was true the city of Boston only intends to operate a recovery campus, that word has been used tonight, recovery campus on Long Island. And why did Boston designate Long Island as an economic opportunity zone under the Federal Tax Relief Act of 2017? This, is, this tax incentive meant to benefit and promote private development, create private development, it is meant as a total, a tool for communities to foster private development. Um, I provided uh, you folks with a map, um, which clearly, which clearly shows um, Long Island as being and the islands being um, designated. Um, to my knowledge, Long Island is is the only island that would be eligible for any development, meaning an island that does not enjoy park protection or isn't already a sewage treatment facility. So again, the question is, why is Long Island designated as an economic opportunity zone? The answer that was received uh, to me was very vague. Uh, the, uh, 
mayor of Boston uh, said he would put something in law in place, and I don't, think, I don't think the people in Quincy saw or heard that, but he said that he would um, even provide money for, the, for roads in Squanum, like tonight, is almost flooded out, and we could, you could, because of the, the full moon and the tide and the, the rain and the wind, it would, it, Squanum becomes an island every so often. And he said he would actually put money into um, preserving that. Also, I provided a article in the Globe, and this, this goes back to uh, September 3rd of 1994. Um, and this was uh, the late Mayor Menino stated, I'm not willing to give anything up that the city owns without compensation. So that was in respect to the Custom House Tower and the Long Island Wharf, which is Long Island. This all would affect the, the, the uh, Indian burial grounds without a question of a doubt if, if this goes through. Um, but, you know, lastly, I, I first would like to make it perfectly clear that I firmly believe we need recovery campuses throughout the region. The epidemic our generation and generations to come is facing, I'd rather have Boston as a partner rather than as a foe. Wasting money and time, which could be attacking this horrible dilemma um, right now. Two heads are always better than one. Instead of no compromise, no communication, it never works ever. Again, the development uh, potentially is almost in place. The size of Long Island could possibly build up to a, 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 a mini city, five times Marina Bay, which will affect the people throughout all of the city of Quincy. And the city of Quincy will not forget what has taken place when this takes place or if it takes place. It's not when, if. Um, I support, I hope you will support my, my resolution and um, again, I thank the members, of, uh, um, the members that have come here and have helped support us. Um, and with that, I make a motion to approve. Uh, I, proof. Proof. At this point, as we start heading into the busy season, I'd like to make sure this is rocking and rolling as we go into the permitting se section of the sessions um, with uh, different agencies that, um, as the Long Island Bridge is being. Um, Just wanted to. Because we have a lot going on and. We do. You know, yep, uh, motion made by Councilor Harris, seconded by Councilor Yang. Any discussion? Seeing, Councilor Palmucci. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to re reiterate. Uh, I'll support this resolve, of course, uh, but I wanted to reiterate a, a really good point that uh, my colleague from uh, Ward Six made about these economic uh, opportunity zones. Uh, this is something that uh, is very new. Uh, the economic opportunity zones were created in the 2017 um, Trump tax cut plan, and what they do is uh, there's I believe 2,700 zones designated across the United States, and what they are is they're an economic incentive to develop, to leverage private capital to develop desired areas. So uh, it's unlike many other federal programs in which uh, you're targeting resources for a, for a purpose to, to serve a need like uh, specific to a low income or, or housing or something like that. What this is, is it's, uh, it's a way in which to maximize development, to draw private money to maximize development. So the fact that Boston would designate that area as an economic opportunity zone is like putting out a flag, a sign, a, a giant billboard, if you will, that says, build something here. We're open for business to build here. So I, I appreciate that the comments that have been made, 
uh, in the city of Boston about recovery, and, and as Councillor Harris suggested, we all echo those sentiments. Uh, but let's not look past what what they're what they're doing. Uh, let, let's not forget what they're doing, uh, and not look past just what they're saying. Because what they're what they're saying is they want a place where people can get much needed services. We agree. Let's buy the first ferry to get them over there, and let's open it. Let's open it now. Let's help them open it now and start ferrying people over there. If the goal is to save lives, why wait? Why pick a battle with the city of Quincy that could take years to litigate? Start helping people now. Councilor Harris supports that. Every councilor up here supports that. The mayor supports that. Why, why have the fight? Why not save the lives? And I don't buy for a second that the other half of the island isn't gonna be developed. The, the other area that, co that comes to mind that I know it was also designated in, that, uh, in 2017 and 2018 after the 2017 federal legislation was, um, was Union Point, which somebody else referenced tonight. Union Point, because there's a development that's struggling to, to get started. Unlike our downtown, which is, it has the momentum and it's going now, uh, it's starting to take off. That Union Point project is stalled. They need an incentive to drive economic development. And what these economic development zones do, is they say is if, uh, if you're a developer or an investor and you have capital gains, right? So you've made money, you, you, you sold an apartment building and you made $10 million, you would normally have to pay either short-term or long-term capital gains tax on that. What this economic opportunity zone says is, if you take those capital gains, your profit, and you put them in an economic opportunity zone, and you hold your money there, you don't have to pay capital gains taxes. So now what's sprouted up is all these uh, economic opportunity funds that are being um, created by financial real estate development uh, companies to leverage all of this money. You take your capital gains, you throw it in this fund, and they're out there <coughs> looking and encouraging development of these economic opportunity zones. I guarantee you someone is looking at that island and what they can build there, and they're just waiting for the bridge because they want to save tax dollars. Everybody does, right? They don't want to pay the capital gains taxes. The city of Boston put up a giant sign on the island that said, for sale, for development by including that in the list of economic opportunity zone areas. So I, I, I appreciate the sentiment that, uh, that the city of Boston makes that they wanna save lives, we agree. Let's, uh, let's get the ferries going, let's start saving lives now, let's not, uh, let's not wait and get bogged down in litigation with the city of Quincy and, and the, you know, the, they've ignored the neighbors, uh, the elected officials who, who represent that area. Uh, They've gone about it the entirely wrong way. They want to save lives, start up the ferries. So I'll certainly support this resolution and anything else that my colleague from Ward 6 brings in relative to this issue. Thank you, Councilor. Any motion made by Council Harris, second by Council Liang. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Councilor DeBorna. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Crow. Yes. Seven. Seven members. Seven members voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Okay. Next item is the approval of previous meeting minutes from April 18th. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. At this point, I am going to recess the regularly scheduled city council meeting uh, for a brief recess, and then we'll go back into ordinance, and we will be back. All right, I would like to call back into order the Monday, April 22nd meeting of the Quincy City Council Ordinance Committee. We don't need to call the roll again, do we? Perfect. Um, just as a reminder to my, my colleagues, the matters before us this evening were council orders 2018-101, um, ordinance amending Title 13, Public Service Chapter Utilities, small cells and um, order number 2019-034, ordinance amending title 17 zoning, section 518, table of off-street parking requirements. Um, Councilor Mahoney, I know that you had a clarification question that you wanted to ask on the parking ordinance. I do. 
so we can just jump back to that for a moment. I want to make sure that you get your question answered. Mr. Mr. Fatsis, if you can just come up to address. Thank you. For you, Chairman. Hi, John. Sorry. I just wanted to see if you could do some clarification for me for provision 5.19 and the subsection 8, where it adds 0.25 spaces per unit for multifamily residential B and C um, for guest parking. So if this was to go to from 1.75 to 2.0, would then would that then be to 2.25? I'm just trying to do the math for the parking. So to repeat, the, in residence B and C districts, the parking requirements for two-family and multi-family dwellings shall be increased by one-fourth parking space per dwelling unit for guest parking. Guest parking must be clearly marked or striped to the satisfaction of the building commissioner. Um, there is very rarely a, uh, a, a call for that, and that is usually not contemplated in our ordinance uh, excuse me, in our rulings, we go to the the two units uh, and, uh, excuse me, the two parking spaces, and that basically covers us on that. Again, this is a area of relief that can be granted, and if we feel that in a particular situation uh, we need additional parking, uh, we will require or request that. Uh, but it is rarely utilized, that, uh, that ordinance. And um, it, it's something that can be taken into consideration as a go forward as well. Yeah. But uh, we've not had many units, or excuse me, we've not had many uh, occasions to have to ask for that extra. I guess if when we get to the point where we're, re, we're re looking at zoning in the city of Quincy, I think we would want to know an audit of that as well. I'm just, I was just sure. curious because when we're looking at the 1.75, that's clearly marked, and then we have the 0.25, and if mm -hmm. we start to add that up, and then it's, it's over. So I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't taken into consideration. Okay. Maybe it's 1.5 and the 0.25 was there, but it's actually 1.75. It's just the numbers are, as I said, they were created 10 years ago. We don't know where or how they were, but... Um, so I was just wondering if, how often that happens. And you're saying very up rarely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other colleagues wishing to speak on the motion? Councilor Carl? Thank you, Chairwoman Liang. Uh, appreciate everybody's input this evening, both of the body again and with the public and members uh, from the planning department. Um, obviously, it's a issue conversation that I find myself in quite frequently, particularly when I'm out, uh, you know, amongst constituents. Um, relative to various projects. So my mind, when it comes to parking, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So with that, I put it on the floor to uh, move for a positive recommendation. It does not require a second. Um, and all in favor? All opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Great. So that motion uh, passes. We're going to just wrap up now the other item that is in committee. Um, Mr. Jerkin, if you can come back up to the podium, please. Um, so what we had left off, there were some counselors who wanted to ask you some questions, and I believe we're going to start with Council Harris um, and then make way over to the side of the aisle. Thank you. Um, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Durkin. Um, first of all, I, I like this picture that I like this picture we got of the poll um, here. I guess it's by Bentley University. Um, nice and straight, really good. Uh, I wish we had these polls in uh, Ward 6 that were straight and weren't leaning over and being held up and, um, and looked as good as this poll. But um, with that being said, um, I didn't have an opportunity to, I did read some of your uh, information that you sent out. And um, as you know, I was, I was very much um, uh, with previous uh, uh, 
as they came in, there was two, two in particular. Uh, one was on Huckins, where there was a request, right? And uh, the request for one of these cells. I would like to ask, though, um, is it going to be, is it going to be as stingent as those folks were there that night where, say for instance, we do have a concern because from what I understand, the butters are all gonna be notified that there's gonna be one of these um, small cells, am I correct, if this goes through? A butters will get notice and there'll be uh, actually a meeting? Councilor, in, in res just to clarify, in response to the concerns that council has expressed in the October, at the October meeting, mm -hmm. I drafted two proposed amendments, amendments to this main ordinance. Right. And those two amendments are um, listed as amendment number one and amendment number two in a packet that you received right. by email. And again, you received right. it tonight. Yep. And what, what these two amendments do is require that the petitioner, mm -hmm. the wireless company, right. when they file its petition, they have to certify that they've notified members of the city council, the city council, they have to notify them right. of the petition uh, where, where they're proposing that the small cell facility would be located, what the poll is, uh, what the number of the poll is, what the address of the poll is, the address that it's closest to, and the address of a residence that it's closest to, so that all of the members of the council would have notification before the process begins that this is, this is, this is happening. So at that point, the thought is, at that point, a particular ward councilor, and having been a ward councilor, I know the way you're thinking, that you may want to notify your constituents. And this would give you an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And the second amendment, that's a companion amendment, would require that once this has gone through the process and the Division of Inspectional Services was, had made the decision to grant a permit, they would have to notify the ward councilor where, where this small cell would be going with 14 days notice before the, before the permit is actually granted. So this is, it's, um, it, th there's, there's two ways that you'd be notified throughout the process. And that was my attempt to let ward councilors and really all of the councilors know that this was going on. Um, so right. So the the let's let me talk about the permitting um, aspect of the whole thing now. In the the way we we're doing it now, we would have to advertise it correctly. No, we, we normally no, oh, the way you correct? do it now. Yes. Yeah, the existing procedure. We, we advertise it, correct? You, you advertise it. Right. There's a there's a public hearing. Right. Yep. Now I'm just gonna stop right there and just say, and that has a cost to it. Am I correct? And then and could I, uh, uh, Madam uh, Treasurer, do you know how much the cost, for instance, possibly, the for instance, the Huckins advertising meant, might have been? Yep. and um, there were two mm -hmm. um, petitions that evening and one cost a thousand dollars and one was almost five hundred dollars so that was fifteen hundred dollars for just two to come in and yes. that came out of the, the taxpayers dollars yes it did so uh, with this new process correct am I right in what I read or heard is that we're actually going to receive money uh, for the perm a permitting fee the permit, there will be a permitting fee under this ordinance, um, but I, I, I would caution the council to, to remember that the, the fee is limited and it's, and it's controlled by FCC regulations. And the FCC regulation that came out most recently was in the fall, and it limited those fees to $100 per application. Well, well, when you think about, we had two applications that cost the city $1,500, the two applications we would have received two hundred dollars, and that's a seventeen hundred dollars just off the top of my head. Do I have that right, math right? So that's math is good. Okay, so we're, we're going in the right direction. Um, as long as again, my concern is what is and was is my constituents, um, but I believe that this this will work. Um, this can work as long as um, we're in the loop, and because I do believe that uh, we have how many did we say sixteen. Uh, permits right now? I believe there are 14 pending, yeah. and I've been told 
by the wireless companies, one in particular, Extinet, they, they um, plan to seek 13 more locations. So that's 39. So if you think about what we would have spent and what we possibly are going to get in, it's to the benefit to the, and we're obviously we're going to get better service in Ward 1 and in Ward 6, as was mentioned. Um, and um, I'll, um, I'll go along with this. I don't think that this is, I think this is something that we can work with or any ward councilor can work with if they have an issue with a, a cell going in front of a particular location. Okay. So thank you for, thank your, you, thank you for your time. And, and I just wanted to get on the record if I could. In this ordinance, there are two provisions which create a buffer zone between, um, be, between small cell antennas and residents, um, residential structures, and between small cell antennas and another small cell antenna. So one of the buffer zones is 20 feet from a residence. The other is 180 feet from another small cell um, wireless facility. And the intent of that is not just um, health, uh, out of health concern, it's out of aesthetics. And I want to get that on the record and I want to make, it, make that clear. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Councilor Kane. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, hi, Steve. How you doing? We spend a lot of time on this, so I'm not trying to belabor anything. Um, just the one thing that I do, I, if somebody has made note that the, uh, the clerk sent us a memo today, and so I see there's just a little difference between what she's requesting and what's proposed in the amendment, and I think it probably pertains to Amendment 2. So uh, just in terms of keeping us in the loop and informed and keeping our constituents in the form, I think that it makes a lot of sense to keep this in the same way that um, the notification process goes for any sort of zoning or, or planning uh, proposals. And so that would be uh, a note you know, from whoever the proposed uh, small cell purveyor would be uh, sent to uh, those direct abutters, including to us, instead of notifying us and having us notify uh, our constituents. Okay, so that would be actually an, um, a further amendment to amendment number one. Yes. Okay. Or, uh, I mean, it, in, in amendment two, it says shall notify the ward counselor. Could we uh, just expand on that and say that, uh, you know, at the expense of the applicant, uh, public notice advertise abutters list of direct abutters be pulled through the assessor's office and notification of those abutters be made through certified mail. So, Councilor, then you'd like the amendment to be to both amendment number one and amendment number two? No, which I mean, I just one, whichever makes sense. I just, no, I just in the second amendment here, it says notify the ward counselor. So, well, if we if we think of the purpose as uh, of notifying the abutters as. Um, giving them sufficient notification so that they can give input, I would suggest that it should be amendment number one because there's not that much time for them to give input between a 14-day notice and the granting of the petition. Okay, that's yeah. fine. I apologize for now. Can I, can I make a suggestion here um, just for, for the purpose of trying to figure out which of the amendments to make this additional amendment to? Um, the first amendment, the way I'm reading it, is that this uh, notice is coming from the petitioner and the second amendment, the way I'm reading it, is that the notice comes from di the director of inspectional services. And so I'm almost wondering if it would be worth it to have two separate notices, so have this amendment in both places, so that the first one is a notice that comes from the petitioner when the petitioner first requests it, and then the second notice comes from DIS when the petitioner gets the grant that it's going to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't, I don't excuse me, I don't want to put any further burden on inspectional services, um, so I think we can we can yeah. change that. Yeah, I think the burden should be on uh, the you know the petitioner or the filer for the application. Okay, makes sense. Um, Thank and you, Councillor. I was just trying to. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Thank when you. we say abutters, are we talking about a direct abutters or abutters to abutters as well? Um, an abutters list of direct abutters would be sufficient, and then I think that as long as we're notified also in that, then we can. Um, make appropriate notifications on top. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. And then um, lastly, I... Can we vote on that so then it becomes well, the working body? Have, have, has the, have these actually been uh, formally...
presented to the council in the form of amendments? They, they've been presented by me. Okay. And um, in my view, these don't change the essential nature of the ordinance. They're relatively minor um, amendments, but they're nevertheless necessary. They're important amendments. And, and, the, and amendments number one and two deal with notifying the council, which is important. And the others, amendments number three through seven, um, actually bring the ordinance in line with the most recent orders of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, that the document we're working off of now. The, the, one that I, the one that I passed out is entirely accurate, has all necessary corrections, and you received that tonight. And that has been accepted by the body as an amendment to what was previously filed? I will just confirm I'm in here, Steve. So I, I from I mean I have like three separate copies here, just from your emails and then from the copies yep. that were provided here tonight. Um, and from what I from what I saw, and you know I invite my colleagues to correct me if I'm wrong here, but from what I saw, the the full clean ordinance that we received tonight did not include the amendments number one through seven. Yes. So I think back to Councillor Pamucci's point, what we need to do is is twofold here. We need to amend the set of amendments. And then after that, if there aren't any other changes, we then have to vote on the amendments to the order that has not been updated to date. Correct? Yes. Okay. Councilor Pamucci, is that where, the point you were getting at? Yeah, I, I would think we would accept as a friendly amendment the amendments that were offered by the administration tonight, and then that's the working document, and then Councilor Kane would move his, I have an amendment too, that's why I'm asking. Right? So then Councilor Kane would move his amendment to the working document, we would vote on it and then proceed accordingly if there are any other amendments. Yeah, I mean, whichever way procedurally this has to work, I'm open to it so long as we just ensure that the amendments and the votes and, and the final version of whatever we vote on tonight is something that we... So I would make the motion then, at this point, I don't want to cut you off, I, but I would make the motion that we accept um, the amendments offered by the administration tonight to the ordinance. And then that'll be the working order that we're working from where we can then introduce your amendment. Okay. Right. Okay, so there's a motion made now for a friendly amendment to accept these seven amendments proposed by the administration to the old order. So don't we don't we don't need a second on an amendment, do we? No. No. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now moving on to this amendment to the amendment. Yep. So uh I'd like him to make an amendment, a motion to make an amendment to amendment number one, uh, uh, which would include uh, having to notify abutters, you know, at the expense of the applicant, a public notice advertised and abutters list of direct abutters be pulled through the assessor's office and notification to those abutters be made through certified mail. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Uh, we don't need a second on that, so all those in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Okay, Councilor Kane, you still have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so last question on the accepted, recently accepted amendment, uh, number three. Now we see a fee of $500 for a single petition up to five locations. So five locations, does that mean one poll, five small cells, or five separate locations? It's five separate locations. Okay. They, it, it, the, the FCC regulations allow them to... Uh, to submit five applications at a time and, and pay the city $500 and then pay for $100 for each other location on and after that. So is that the maximum that the federal law allows for? The maximum is $100 per, per location. Okay, so this 500 for five locations is no, yeah. it's just the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm finished, thank you. Thank you. Councilor McCarthy? Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Steve, thanks. Uh, when we first spoke about this, it was uh, all new to me um, last year. And um, thanks for coming back and forth with me on a lot of my questions. I mean, one of my big questions was the quantity. I know you answered that question for me today. You had uh, done some uh, due diligence in regards to making sure um, we wouldn't be saturated, I think the word you used, in, in any area, Ward 1, Ward 6, any ward. <clears throat> so thank you for that. and. Uh, I know you mentioned Howe's Neck and the storm, and yes, the police and fire and, and folks down there. Um, there are places that drop off, um, that drop off bad. And, uh, you know, safety first. And, and I, I, I know that uh, um, I've spoken to the chief a little bit in um, 
past months about it to just get a little more educated on it. Um, but I want to thank you for you going back and forth a little bit to getting us to this point. I also want to thank the city clerk for also jumping in um, and doing a little homework to make sure we were clear on everything. The one part, and, and I'm glad um, Suzanne Condon was here this evening, but I, I'm reading that part about thus the city, I'm at public concerns. I, I'm, you know, um, in one of your packages, Steve. Um, yep. And it says that the city may not deny any application for the placement of a small cell antenna on a privately owned pole on a public way based on health concerns if such facilities are in compliance with federal RF emission standards. Now, I'm looking at the Bentley picture that Mr. Harris talked about. It's on a pole. I, 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 what is that term, facilities? Facilities, I mean, re facilities refers to the antenna and accessories to the antenna. That's, that's so accessories on the pole, around the antenna, yeah. are in compliance with those, those, we're just talking about the pole. It actually refers to emissions. And, and I'll read the section from the, from the Telecommunications Act. Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act provides that, quote, no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement of wireless facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the FCC's regulations concerning such emissions. And what that means is if the wireless company has a small cell that's in compliance with radio frequency emission standards, if they meet those federal standards, then you can't deny them access to that pole. Okay. All right. So I understand that a little bit better. I, I was confused a little bit um, with facilities versus poles. Yeah. And, and, I, and I received a couple of calls just in regards. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a concern over um, really how many. I know we talked about 39 or 40 that are spread around. And I've asked this, uh, the city clerk to break it down by ward. I want to get a good understanding uh, on where, I guess, the, the recent 14 or we'll say, let's say they all come through, the, the 39 or so, where they're going to be placed. But um, folks were still concerned um, about those um, emissions, about those, those, they were just concerned about them, and they want to make sure, I know you have in here 20 feet off the abutter. I, I, I applaud uh, Councillor Kane for digging in a little bit more to make sure we don't miss something on a pole and we miss something else that's there that's going to cause a situation. And I'm just randomly throwing that out. But that way we can really take a hard look and work with um, Jay Duca and make sure we, we get it right and, and everybody is um, uh, in agreement. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks, and I, Suzanne. I neglected, um, I neglected to introduce him, but he was introduced anyway. Jay Duca was present earlier this evening. And he has said uh, many times that he's ready and willing and able, and his department is ready, willing, and able to fulfill these new responsibilities if the council is inclined to move toward an administrative process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor DeBona? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Assistant City Solicitor Durkin, uh, Suzanne Carnan, thank you for your hard work on this. This is. Um, um, when we first deliberated about this, we needed a lot of, we had a lot of questions, and I want to thank my colleagues up here tonight just by really dissecting this thing and making sure we're doing it right. I, I, you know, I get back to, um, to the fact of um, the technological advances and how much um, uh, a wireless device we use nowadays, these cell phones, are almost, uh, the landlines are becoming almost obsolete in households. So when, when I think of... Um, if an emergency was for 911, um, our state representative, Tacky Chan, wrote a letter to the, to the body here talking about 64% of the 911 calls are from these emergency devices, these wireless devices. And um, in a natural disaster, it's up to 66, uh, 76%. So you're, you're looking at a wide range of, of, of things that could happen. And for us, as a city, as a municipality, um, we need to get up and roll out this uh, 5G network and get to the standards of, uh, of being above, above the grade. So I, I'm in full support of this, and um, I'm happy that we, we got a lot of the stuff ironed out here tonight because 
going back and forth. We, we had a little bit of dis, uh, um, amendments. I want to thank you for doing your, your work on these amendments and then an amendment to the, a friendly amendment to the amendment uh, that you put forward. So um, we just have to think about um, what we're doing here in the city. We're, we're doing a lot of construction. We're doing a lot of uh, updating, revitalization. We kind of have to keep up with the technological ends of it. So I'm happy to support this. I'm happy that we deliberated on it and made it a little bit more. It got a little confusing here tonight, but we, we came to the conclusion we have something here. We have, we have a document, as someone would say across the way. Um, and uh, um, thank you for, 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 for doing this tonight. Thank you, Councilor. Welcome. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Bamucci? I move to amend the current working version, section 13.12.110.1, subsection D, to add subsection 13. This is page three of four, the upper half. You'll see it goes uh, five to 12. I seek to add by amending, um, amending by adding section 13, the utility pole is not within five feet of any other utility pole. So the way that would read is under section D, it'd be standard of review. The director of inspectional services shall issue a permit to a petitioner for the installation of a small cell facility within 90 days of the submission of a petition submitted pursuant to this section if such petition demonstrates the following. So my amendment would add, demonstrates the following, that the utility pole is not within five feet of any other utility pole. Uh, my aim here is that if they want to add a cell, uh, a small cell to a pole, it can't be a double pole. They gotta take down that double pole first. So five feet, I think, is a broad enough definition or length that um, if there's a double pole holding up that one pole they wanna put on, they would have to remove it. So I'd offer that as an amendment. Um, number 13 to section D in this ordinance. Um, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, Council Pemichi, you still have the floor. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Council Mahoney? I just have a quick question, uh, Mr. Durkin. When we're talking about this and we're showing the photo, the existing conditions, and then you show the photo of the proposed conditions, it has one unit on it. Is that correct? One? Yes. So when we're talking about the 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 um, ordinance, will, there be, will that one pole be able to have multiple? No. Only one, right? Just one. But the next pole down, would it be able to have another one because it doesn't have the original one? As long as it's 180 feet away. Okay, so, so really it's one unit per pole and 180 feet before the next one. So if Verizon comes in and would you, I think you said um, mobility, who are the three companies? That we have? Verizon, Extinet, and mobility, but Extinet, um, is a company that gets locations for other providers such as right. AT&T, mm -hmm. uh, at least AT&T. I'm not sure about the others. So I just want to make sure I understand. So, so if Verizon comes in and AT&T come in, they can't be on the same pole together. No. And the next one, they can have five poles in a street potentially or five locations, right? On a long street, sure. Yeah. So I guess I'm trying to understand how that would work, like if it's on C Street because we want to make sure that people have the access to cell phone use and I use Verizon so my phone now works but if I use AT&T will my phone work or no? That's that's a science question and um, the answer is no from Council for Verizon. Okay so I guess I guess I'm trying to understand then so because we're trying to we're trying to have this be something that will be connecting people with their phones because it's a concern so I just want to understand how this then well all of these wireless companies are competing to provide service within cities and towns. Absolutely. And so they're going to be... I don't want them to have multiple. I don't want to have multiple things on a pole anyway. I just, I just yeah. want to make sure, yeah. But they're, they're competing to get locations mm -hmm. that are going to be able to um, provide service to their customers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but there's going to be limitations. And, and we've imposed some of those limitations here. Okay. So I just want to make sure, again, I'm going to say it one more time just so we're all on the same page. Yeah. One unit per pole, 180 feet. Verizon gets there first. Verizon is the carrier you want if you live down the neck. <laughs> um, but if AT&T doesn't and they come in later, they won't be able to put up things because potentially. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, it, um, 
based on different estimates that have been offered, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a sufficiently uh, large amount of footage <laughs> space from one pole to another mm -hmm. with the same carrier such that you shouldn't have to worry about that. Okay. If that makes sense. It does. I just want to make sure that, again, I'll go back to that. And then, uh, it, because you can't have, I just want to, because that space too, if you had more than one, potentially that would have a different emissions off of the pole. So scientifically speaking. So I just want to understand, I want to understand that too. Because I do still think it, I mean, I understand that they're fed federally regulating it and saying, it doesn't matter if it causes health concerns, um, but it does to me. Um, and that the way you can limit that is by making sure that you really only have one unit per pole. Um, and, and that's the way I'm reading that too. So 180 feet between poles, Verizon might do 180, 360, and then somebody else could be in between. So not necessarily going to have to put them at every pole is how I'm understanding this. Yes. And just, Steve, if we could, I just want to reiterate that um, consistent with the FCC, mm -hmm. the reason that we have this footage distance is for aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, we believe that by addressing the aesthetic issues, yeah. we can also address health issues that exactly and, I, and that was one of my concerns Steve, when you were here before that we didn't have multiple units on one pole and you know how are we going to be able to deal with that and the spacing in between and i realized that the, if they're a private pole it's a different situation and I, and also this the footage be I, I certainly don't want them anywhere near schools or different things but that's it's, it's it comes down to aesthetics and it also comes down to and i know you it, you're you've reiterated several times tonight health concerns are not what the federal government is concerned about, but they, they will be when there's big problems. So, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, and, and most of these polls are owned privately, as you say, Councillor, mm -hmm. but they're owned by the company that wants to put the, the cell up. They already have a grant of location. Now they want to put a, a small no, cell I understand. on it. Yeah. Yep. No, I, and, and that's, I understand, I just, but I just wanted to make sure that I understood. They also can lease them out to other people, so they could have the poll, and Verizon might own the poll, but AT, they don't want to put something on it, so ATT can put it on, so long as there's spatial requirements for that, and it's single use per poll. Yes. Thank you. Ronnie, anyone else like to speak on this? Okay. Uh, no. Have a moment to speak if that's okay before we move forward just quickly um because you know this was introduced uh, about a year ago and even before that i know um councillor hughes and councillor finn had been working on this for quite some time as well and you know we talked earlier tonight about making sure that as councillors and as representatives of, of the residents that we have enough tools in our toolbox to um you know to make sure that we can advocate for those that that need it and who we ask you know that we can advocate for and so in this process you know i know that we are creating a structure that's going to work um moving forward just to you know create consistency in how this is going to operate and how people can expect that the application process will work and then it also creates consistency for residents to know what to expect as well um, and so i think it's great that you know we, yes it's taken a year to get here but i know it's because a lot of foresight has been put into this um, you know last you came in front of us we had a slew of questions to ask of you and i know that you took this amount of time to be thorough about getting those answers to make sure that you're working with suzanne working with Nikki in the clerk's office to, you know, again, get those answers um, for us to make sure that we feel comfortable moving forward and creating this procedure. So I just wanted to thank you for that. I know how much work you put into this. I know you went to meetings. I know you set yourself up to go to different um, different forums and, and, you know, outside of the city to educate yourself on this. Again, along with Suzanne and her expertise, you know, you left no stone unturned um, in this process. And I do appreciate you being so thorough and answering our concerns the last we had spoke about this. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure to get that out there and let you know that I do appreciate that because not a lot of times do we um, have the opportunity up here when we have so many questions to have somebody uh, be so thorough in their in their process to get us a response. So I appreciate that. Um, and with that, I, we have a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you, Steve. Um, and with that, I will close the ordinance committee meeting at 9.45 p.m. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled Quincy City Council meeting back to order, and we will begin with communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards, and Madam Clerk. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council President. I do have um, some traffics to refer to Ordinance Committee for advertising this evening. I have uh, four in Ward 1, remove stop sign on Longwood Road, southbound, eastbound, intersecting with Highfield Road, add a no parking on both sides of C Street from Bayview Ave to Fensmere Ave, 
Add no parking on the south side of Bailey Street from Marymount to Park Lane. Add handicap parking at 20 Woodwood Ave. Ward 2, add a stop sign at Penns Hill Road, northbound sec intersecting with Viden Road. Ward 3, add two hour parking on both sides of Division Street, West Quantum Street to end. And I also have this evening um, two correspondence that I would like to read in um, two grants of locations to be referred. I have um, a grant of location for Whitwell Street for Mass Electric and Verizon to um, um, install and eliminate a pole and install a new pole from P3 to 84 Whitwell Street. Okay, and those? And I have one more, which is um, grant of location from AT&T TC Systems at 1500 Hancock Street. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Those will all go to ordinance for Adam. Council Harris? Uh, one utility. Was there one utility? Uh, there's one, two, utilities. two utilities. There's one up on Whitwell Street that is um, request to erect and maintain a pole. They're going to install a new pole and eliminate pole to T tree guy at P3 Whitwell. And then the second one is a utility grant to location AT&T TC Systems, 1500 Hancock Street. What's up? Okay, great. Any uh, unfinished business preceding meeting? Seeing none, reports of committees. Councillor Liang. Mr. President, all right, so we have a couple of traffics I'm going to get through first. Um, they're all on Ward 4. The first is 2019-066. I do not enter on Robert Street northbound intersecting with Brooks Ave from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, seconded by Council Palmochi. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Councilor DeBona. Yeah. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Eight members. Okay, Eight next members. we have 2019-067. Add no right turn on Gilbert Street westbound intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Council Pelmucci. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. Thank you. Next is 2019-068. Add no right turn on Nightingale Ave westbound intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Councillor Lang. Second by Councillor Palmucci. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor DeBona. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Hughes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. Okay, we've got 2019-069. I had no left turn on Nightingale Ave eastbound, intersecting with Robert Street from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Liang, second by Council Pelmucci. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yeah. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. All right, last one on the traffic, 2019-070. No right turn on Robert Street, southbound intersecting with Night and Gill Ave from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. on school days. I move positive recommendation. On the motion. On the motion. Council Pelmucci. I just want to say I think this might be the last uh, of the um, do not enters during certain times so that I've now effectively made West Quincy and South Quincy impenetrable <laughs> to anyone who doesn't live there. So you'll be second in that motion, I, I assume. Second One that motion. Presume. That's right. That's right. Perfect. <laughs> motion made by Council Yang, second by Council Palmucci. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. 
Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Crow. Yes. Eight Thank members. Thank you. And then we've got 2018-101 ordinance amending Title 13 Public Services Chapter 13.12 Utilities Small Sales. I move positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Council Palmucci. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. 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 Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Krull. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. The item passed. Thank you. And just the last one out of ordinance committee, we have 2019-030, sorry, 034, ordinance amending Title 17 zoning, section 5.1.8, table of off-street parking requirements and positive recommendation. Motion made by Council Yang, second by Council McCarthy. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. President Curl. Yes. Eight members. Eight members. Thank you, Council Yang. Thank you. All right. Any other uh, reports of committees? Uh, presentations of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. I, uh, Council DeBone, did you have one? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, Mr. President, I just want to, <clears throat> with great sorrow, um, Margaret Buchanan, Peggy Buchanan of the Moorings, just passed away mm -hmm. on uh, Monday, May, uh, Monday, April 8th. She was 90 years old. I first met um, Peg over at the St. Patrick's Breakfast in South Boston in 2013, and um, she's been an instru instrumental part of my, my life um, being in an elected office. So, um, you know, the biggest thing she did this past year and her 90th birthday is she um, spent it with her family at Fenway Park in September 2018 and um, that was really she was really proud of that so um, she was she was very involved in the community as well a muscular dystrophy association st. Jude's and many other um, associations um, she leaves behind eight children uh, 19 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren so she's made an impact, um, and she'll be dearly missed um, throughout the city of Quincy and then the moorings. Um, her wake will be um, at the Cohane Funeral Home uh, on Monday, April 28th, 29th at 4 to 8. So um, she's going to be dearly missed. Um, on another note, if I could, before you, Councilor Kroll, is um, I'd also like to um, um, Congratulate the uh, Stop and Shop workers for their 11-day strike. Uh, um, I participated a couple times um, going out to the Stop and Shops, the uh, Newport Ave, Southern Artery, and uh, I went to the Boston Rally where Joe, um, presidential uh, participant Joe Biden was. And um, to see the support of all the other local unions um, get together and really um, stand in solidarity. So, um, you know, uh, 11 days, um, I know a lot of people were going to other supermarkets. Um, it, was, it was kind of a crazy Easter. Um, they came, they came to, an, to a tentative agreement yesterday, but everybody was at these different um, supermarkets and uh, um, it was kind of packed. Um, so I just wanna um, you know, congratulate the workers for, for standing with each other and the other local unions for standing with them. And, um, they're going back, they went, the stores open today and they went back to work, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor DeBona. Um, it's with deep sadness that I report the, uh, the passing of uh, Chicky Abdallah, oh. who I'm sure many folks uh, across this body in some form or fashion have, uh, you know, crossed paths with Miss Abdallah. She was absolutely one of the matriarchs of Quincy Point. Um, actively, actively involved in our community for, for decades, quite frankly, and um, always with the community's interest uh, first at heart. Um, you know, I remember meeting Chicky when I first got involved 15 years ago, and I think one of the, uh, you know, beautiful character traits that she had was she, she had the ability to make people want to get involved and then challenge them to continue to, uh, to advance their involvement. 
Um, she was actively involved in the city of Quincy's uh, Beaches Commission, uh, one of the founders of the, the John Hancock birthday plunge, which we used to do right around January in the freezing cold down Wollaston Beach, all for raising uh, you know money for a good cause. A longtime member of the Wood Two Civic Association and just an, an absolute community activist, um, heart of gold. And, um, you know, she, she worked very hard to make sure that uh, everybody always had a voice. And uh, seeing her in action uh, was, was something to behold. You know, to know her was certainly to love her. And, um, you know, I, I recall this past, um, past Christmas, we had the first uh, tree lighting down at Quincy Point, and um, she led us in the, in the countdown, you know, the, the five, four to one. And uh, just seeing the sense of accomplishment on her face when that happened was um, tremendous because that was an issue that she deeply advocated for. And her thought was, well, if other cross sections of the town have tree lightings, why don't we? Um, and she, you know, was one of those people that uh, left an indelible mark on, on the community um, right up till, you know, the end. She, um, you know, has some children living locally, uh, Freddie Abdallah down uh, Quincy Point, Abby Ash down the point, and uh, Jimmy Abdallah from, um, from Weymouth. Also, several grandchildren, Nicole Price and, and Richard Ash. And I just wonder if you're watching here this evening, uh, her service, her, her wake service is Thursday evening, four to eight over at Dennis Sweeney on Elm Street. So. We certainly uh, will miss Chickie and all the um, you know positive stuff she did for the city of Quincy. Uh, I'd also like to uh, take a moment and uh, send out, send our thoughts and prayers to the McIntyre family. Miss Sheila McIntyre, uh, wife of former Mayor Jim McIntyre, recently passed, and um, as we all know, the amount of uh, commitment that the spouse. Uh, puts in, you know, to uh, public service is tremendous. I remember reading uh, some r comments about Miss McIntyre, and she was actively involved uh, throughout the city. So another tremendous loss to the community, and I ask that we keep the McIntyre family in our prayers. Um, any other petitions, memorials, remonstrance, motions, orders, resolutions? Uh, scheduling of committee meetings. We're back in the room on Wednesday, April 24th for the URDP at 6.30. Anybody else want to schedule something? Nothing? We're good? Okay. With that, Motion so moved.